Well, thank you all again for joining me on this episode of The Freed Thinker. As always, I'm your host, Tyler Vela. On this episode, I uh, am joined by Jonathan McClatchy uh, to be giving a case on the, is giving a presentation on the Maximal case for the resurrection. So let me bring Jonathan in here. How are you? I'm doing very well. Great to be here. How are you? Oh, I'm doing I'm doing very well. Thanks for thanks for joining and making the time uh, to to come and uh, give the presentation here. Um, for those who you know live under a rock and don't know who you are in these uh, you know apologetics discussions and discussions about the New Testament, uh, why don't you tell my audience a little bit about you and your background? Sure. So I'm Jonathan McClatchy. You can find my website at jonathanmcclatchy.com. It features my blog and I um, share my videos uh, there that I've uploaded to YouTube, etc. Um, I also am the founder of talkaboutdoubts.com, which is a ministry where we seek to um, offer private mentoring to Christians who are struggling with doubts in regards to their faith, as well as talk to ex-Christians who are exploring whether there's a rational path back to faith. Um, I did my PhD at University of Newcastle up on Tyne in Northeast England, and that is in the life sciences. I did my PhD in evolutionary biology. I worked as a professor of biology for four years at a Christian liberal arts college in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, called Sattler College. Um, so I was there for four years, and now um, I live in Seattle, Washington, just moved there with my wife um, beginning of uh, end of May um, and started a new job here beginning of June at the Discovery Institute uh, Center for Science and Culture, where I do a lot of work on uh, intelligent design, uh, ev um, evidence of God, in, uh, in particular the life sciences. And uh, so that's uh, been my, my passion uh, for, for many years. And I'm also uh, interested in New Testament scholarship and the case for the resurrection of Jesus and Christology um, and Messianic prophecy and answering Jewish objections to Jesus and a whole range of issues pertaining to biblical scholarship, especially as it relates to the New Testament. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining. Um, maybe I'll have to have you on another time to talk about something related to, to science and biology along those lines uh, would be interesting. I, I largely stayed out of those topics uh, as much as I as much as I could was not my background at all. So uh, you would uh, definitely uh, be, be the expert there. Um, so I wanted to have you on. So, uh, you know, my audience knows and we and we've had a couple conversations. So, um, you know, since since my deconversion, I've done a couple of shows responding to the minimal, uh, you know, kind of a minimal case um, for the resurrection. And even when I was a, when I was a believer and I was in apologetics, I didn't really find the minimal case that compelling or or um, or. or or that robust. Uh, I, well, I shouldn't say robust. There's lots of work on it. I, I, I didn't find it that compelling, I should say. I just, I just didn't think it was that strong of an argument. Um, and, and there are some scholars <clears throat> like uh, the McGrews and yourself who have uh, started over the last, how many years has it been that you all been working on this? Oh, um, it's been a, a few, I think. Um, a while. I, yeah, yeah, a yeah. while. Um, you, you all started uh, doing, doing some work on, you know, alternative ways um, from alternative from the minimal <clears throat> to defend the resurrection uh, historically, um, and it's come to be known as the the maximal case. Now I, I've heard you all use maximal case. Is that the right term for it? Is there a better term for it? Or are you all happy with with maximal case for resurrection? Yeah, typically we call it the maximal data approach. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but it's uh, basically an approach that was inspired by uh, the famed Christian philosopher William Paley who wrote towards the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, he was uh, he, he wrote a number of uh, excellent uh, Christian books, uh, including uh, Horror Polony, where he coined uh, this idea of undesigned coincidences, particularly relating to the Book of Acts and the letters of Paul. And uh, he also published another book uh, subsequent to that called A View of the Evidence of Christianity, um, which uh, my wife actually for my birthday this year got me the original printing of that from 1795. Oh, nice. uh, and then uh, he also published his most famous work, which is A Natural Theology and viewers might have come across the watchmaker thesis from natural theology. So uh, Lydia McGrew in her book, uh, Hidden in Plain View, basically um, uh, updated uh, or, and um, revived uh, William Paley's uh, work relating to undesigned coincidences. And uh, Paley, in his book, A View of the Evidence of Christianity, he fleshes out and articulates what we now call the maximal data case. And we'll be talking about that today. 
Fantastic. Well, uh, I don't want to take up any more time. I know we want to finish this at just about an hour, uh, hour five, somewhere right in there. So um, I'll hand this over to you. If you want to share screen, I'm going to mute. Just so you know, uh, I have two screens. You're right here. My notes are right here. So if I'm not looking, I'm I'm listening I'm, and I'm taking notes and writing questions. So um, uh, just so, so everyone knows. So uh, I'll hand it over to you when you're ready to, to share. I, I don't know if you share if I have to push it into the studio. I think yeah, I'm just trying to make sure I get the sure right. Get the right uh, okay, you should now be able to see it. There you go. Excellent. I'm gonna actually make it a little bit bigger so there's text. All right, all right. I'm gonna mute, and uh, it's all you. All right, I will try to keep uh, this to 20 minutes or less. So um, yeah, I'm going to be presenting on the case for the resurrection, in particular at the maximal data approach. Just I mentioned this already, but this is my organization that I founded, talkaboutdoubts.com. So if anyone in the audience uh, is a Christian struggling with doubts about faith or is an ex-Christian wanting to explore whether there's a rational path back to faith, please feel free to come to our website, submit a contact form. One of our specialists uh, who has PhD level expertise in your area of questioning will be in touch to set up a, a private call to talk about your doubts with you in confidence. And uh, so highly recommend uh, coming uh, to that resource if uh, that will be helpful. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let me launch into uh, my case for the resurrection of Jesus. I'm not going to dwell upon some of the shortcomings and deficiencies of the minimal facts approach just for the sake of time, but if we want, to, if you want to talk about it later uh, in the discussion, feel free to ask about uh, why I'm not on board with the minimal facts case. Let me just summarize um, my, uh, I have basically five lines of argument that I would typically present for the truth of Christianity. Um, I'll just summarize those briefly. The argument for the resurrection we'll be discussing this evening in some detail. Uh, the trilemma argument, uh, which was uh, is most famously associated with C.S. Lewis, uh, but uh, also um, has been championed by other writers before him, including G.K. Chesterton. Uh, that is, uh, um, well, I won't go through it to that tonight. The, Messianic, the argument for Messianic prophecy, um, the um, argument from the conversion of St. Paul. Uh, the best book on that topic is Observations on the Conversion of St. Paul by George Little Littleton, who actually lived during the deist controversy in England. He was a deist a critic of Christianity, and he set out to write a book debunking Christianity with a focus on the conversion of Paul or Saul of Tarsus, and he actually ended up becoming a Christian as a result of that endeavor and wrote his book from a Christian perspective. So highly recommend uh, that one, that piece of work. Um, the Art for Contemporary Miracles that J.P. Moreland and Craig Keener and Robert Larmer and Lee Strobel and others have written books on as well. So these would be my five uh, chief arguments for the truth of Christianity. So how then do I um, formulate the case for the resurrection particularly? So this is a summary of my approach, which, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, is inspired from the work of William Paley. So firstly, I would contend that we possess testimony from apostolic eyewitnesses that Jesus rose physically from the dead and appeared to the disciples alive after his death. Um, the, and secondly, uh, I would contend that the content of the apostolic testimony that we find in the Gospels and Acts make it enormously improbable that they were deceived into thinking that Jesus rose again or that they were delusional. Thirdly, the circumstances of the apostolic testimony makes it enormously improbable that they were deceivers, that they were setting out to deliberately deceive people or lie to people. Therefore, the most probable explanation is that the content of their testimony is true. So let's look at these uh, contentions uh, in turn. So we'll start with the first, that we possess testimony from apostolic eyewitnesses that Jesus was physically from the dead and appeared to the disciples alive. So um, where might we turn to begin with? So uh, Luke, I would contend, is a traveling companion of Paul. He was personally acquainted with uh, several of the apostles, uh, in particular uh, Paul, Peter, James, John. And in Acts chapter 2, he, um, he mentions that the, pro the earliest proclamation of the apostles following Jesus' death, this is at Pentecost, um, was that Jesus had been raised from the dead and had appeared to the disciples alive. Uh, Peter um, testifies along with the 11, according to uh, Acts 2. He says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch uh, about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Okay, um, and um, what is the nature of those claimed experiences, um, according to the author of Acts? Well, we 
just need to turn to, to Luke 24, composed by the same author, to find out. And we discover that the nature of the experiences of the apostles that they were testifying to uh, were multi-sensory in character, involving not just individual sightings at a great distance and very briefly, but rather group sightings, group conversations, physical contact, um, et cetera, eating broiled fish with Jesus uh, on the shore of the Sea of uh, sorry, eating broiled fish with Jesus in Luke 24. There's another occasion in John where he's breakfast with the disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, um, et cetera. So, um, so, so that's the nature of the claim that we're talking about. But one might object, well, how, how do we know that we can trust Luke Acts to give us an accurate account of what the apostles were claiming concerning the, uh, the experiences of the apostles? Well, um, Let's apply two tests. The first one is that Luke Acts says, it claims that it is grounded in eyewitness testimony um, with Jerusalem witnesses. I'll explain what I mean by that. And secondly, that the author reliably worked with Paul and so was at the Jerusalem church. So let's turn to the first of those. So Luke claimed to, receive, to have received information from eyewitnesses. So if we turn to the prologue of Luke, he tells us, and, and he addresses it to his patron Theophilus, it says, and as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. And so he, Luke claims to have received information in some sense from eyewitnesses, uh, whether that's from personal interviews that he's conducted or from written sources, etc. It's not, it's not uh, entirely clear just from the prologue of Luke. We can, however, establish that Luke had direct access to individuals who were eyewitnesses, and that uh, dovetails nicely with the prologue of his gospel. So in, uh, um, in Acts 21, this is one of the passages that are among what we call the we passages uh, from Acts 16 and following. We see the use of the plural pronouns we, which implies that the author is claiming to be a, a, a traveling companion of Paul um, during those adventures. And in Acts 21, it says, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. So Luke is present with Paul upon this trip to Jerusalem. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. And so who were the elders of the uh, Jerusalem church? Well, according to Galatians, it included at minimum Peter, James, John, and uh, uh, Luke is telling us here that all the elders of, of the Jerusalem church were present at this meeting. And of course, subsequent to this, Luke was, was present with Paul during Paul's imprisonment in Caesarea Maritima for at least two years, and would have had ample access to those witnesses, because Caesarea is close to Jerusalem, uh, of the resurrection. And so Luke is at least in a position to know what the witnesses were claiming concerning the nature and variety of the resurrection encounters with the risen Jesus. Okay, so what about the second test then? The author reliably worked with Paul, and so was at the Jerusalem church. How do we know that Luke is telling us the truth about being present at the Jerusalem church um, in Acts 21? Well, let's look at, um, I'm just going to give three examples. This is a sample of just one category of evidence that we call undesigned coincidences, which was a term coined by William Paley, whom I mentioned earlier. I'm just going to give you three examples. Um, this is um, where we have dovetailings between the Book of Acts and the Pauline letters. So, um, and I would contend that this uh, evidence cumulatively is best explained by Luke being very uh, intimately acquainted with Paul's travels, which I think is best accounted for on the supposition that he was indeed a traveling companion of Paul. So in 1 Corinthians, and we understand that Corinthians, 1 Corinthians was written from Ephesus uh, in Asia Minor, and he's writing to this Greek city called Corinth, which happens to be the capital of Achaia. And he says in chapter 4, verse 17, that's why I sent you Timothy, my faithful and beloved child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. And so notice the past tense here. That is why I sent you Timothy. So at the time of his writing from Ephesus to Corinth, he's evidently already sent Timothy on his way. Nonetheless, when you get to chapter 16, verse 10, it says, when Timothy comes, see that you put him ease among you, for he's doing the work of the Lord as I am. So notice the future tense here. This implies that Paul expects this letter to arrive before Timothy does. So what would we infer from those subtle clues in 1 Corinthians? Well, the, we'd infer that Timothy must have taken a route from Ephesus to Corinth that's less direct than that taken by the letter. And uh, this is the map. This is where Ephesus is over here in Asia Minor. 
And uh, the most obvious way in those days uh, to send a letter would be by boat over the Aegean Sea from Ephesus to Corinth. And we'd infer from those subtle clues in 1 Corinthians that Timothy must have taken the indirect over land route going up through Troas and Macedonia on his way around to Corinth. Now, if we turn to Acts chapter 19, verse 21 and 22, it says, after these events, this is when they were in Ephesus, it says, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, that's where Corinth is, and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I had been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So indeed, Paul does remain behind in Ephesus, and he sends Timothy along with his buddy Erastus up through Macedonia, precisely as we predicted from those clues in 1 Corinthians. But notice that Acts doesn't even mention Corinth as Timothy's destination. It's very, very indirect, um, and, uh, and, and but it fits nicely with what we see in 1 Corinthians. Um, now, turn over to Acts 20. The next chapter, this is after the uproar in Ephesus, it says, after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, <clears throat> he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through these regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and it's actually during that three-month stint uh, in Corinth that he writes the letter to the Romans. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So to the Bereans and Empress accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy. So you'll notice that Timothy apparently did in fact make it to Corinth. Um, and so this fits very, very nicely with what we see in 1 Corinthians, but does so in such an indirect way that it actually, I think, has evidential value in corroborating the historicity of the account. Um, but let's go back to our text in Acts 19. Who's Timothy's traveling companion up through Macedonia? It's Erastus. Who's Erastus? We learn from Romans 16, 23, because remember I mentioned that Romans was written during that three-month stint in Corinth. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. He's the city treasurer of Corinth. He's resident from Corinth. Also, 2 Timothy 4, 20 mentions that Erastus remained at Corinth. So it's Corinth, it turns out, was Erastus' hometown. And we actually have an archaeological discovery, a pavement slab that was recovered from the ruins of ancient Corinth that bears the inscription that Erastus bore the expense of this pavement in Latin. So, um, so that um, makes... Uh, perfect sense that he would be traveling with Erastus. He happens to be uh, a resident from Corinth. That is very, very fitting. So it all hangs together in precisely the way we would expect on the hypothesis of historical reportage. Here's a second example. So if we turn over to Acts 15, you'll recall Paul's second missionary journey, where he is going along with Barnabas. And it says that Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them and Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Sals and departed, having been commanded by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So um, we might wonder, as we read this text, why is Barnabas so keen for John Mark to travel along with them on their second missionary journey, even though he's previously abandoned Paul in, and withdrawn from them in Pamphylia. Now, this disagreement is so sharp that they actually separate. Um, what is uh, Barnabas's connection to Mark? Well, the question is actually answered in Colossians, one of Paul's uh, um, prison epistles uh, written from Rome, where he mentions in chapter 4, verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Uh, and so apparently Mark and Barnabas has had a familial relationship. They were cousins, which then illuminates what's going on in Acts 15. There's a familial relationship between Mark and Barnabas, which um, ex which uh, helps to clarify plausibly why Mark and um, why Barnabas wants Mark to come along with them, even though Paul is not at all keen. Um, let's uh, take another example. This is from. Acts 17 says the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. This, so this is um, um, speaking about the occasion in Acts 17 when so Paul had been in Thessalonica and there was some Jews that stirred up some trouble for him in Thessalonica. So he had to leave to go to uh, Berea. And then uh, uh, the Jews, the Jewish mob from Thessalonica came to Berea to start trouble from there too. So he has to leave uh, in haste for uh, Athens. And so it mentions in verse 4, 14, 15, that the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Sal's and Timothy remained there. Those who could not take Paul and brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command for Sal's and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. And um, if we go to 1 Thessalonians 3, um, so notice, um, before we go there, so notice that um, 
the Acts leaves the separation of Paul and Timothy unexplained. So he mentions that Timothy is um, supposed to remain behind in Berea, but we're not told why Timothy doesn't accompany Paul to Athens. Uh, this is an unexplained allusion in Acts. But in 1 Thessalonians 3, uh, we, met, we read, therefore, when he could bear it no longer, we were, will, we were willing to be left behind to Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith. In other words, um, when, so to, to integrate these accounts, uh, Berea, it turns out, is less than 50 miles west of Thessalonica. Paul left Berea for Athens in haste because Jews from Thessalonica came to Berea to stir up the people against him. And under the circumstances, apparently Paul was worried about the Christians in Thessalonica. And so what did he do? He therefore commissioned Timothy to go back to Thessalonica to check on the church there to see how they were doing. Um, that, is not, that information is not supplied to us by Acts. It's only when we read First Thessalonians that supplies the background to Acts that it begins to make sense. And that's precisely what we'd expect. Again, on the hypothesis of historical reportage, this is another undesigned coincidence. Um, so Luke in Acts has just admitted the sending of Timothy from Berea to Thessalonica, thus leaving the cause of his separation from Paul unexplained. Okay, so that's just um, a sample of three uh, examples uh, of one category of evidence that bears on the historicity of Acts and the author being a traveling companion of Paul. There's also a lot more. I've got over 40 examples of that sort of undesigned coincidence and over 100 examples of external corroborations of Acts. But let's look at the next contention then, that the content of the apostolic testimony makes it enormously improbable that they were deceived. When we study the Gospels and Acts, um, and we've been focusing on Luke here, we discover that the uh, experiences are public. Jesus appears to multiple people at once. Uh, they are multi-sensory. They involve not just sight, but hearing, conversation, even group conversation, physical contact, eating breakfast with Jesus in the Sea of Galilee, um, and uh, extended discourses like the Maze Disciples in Luke 24, etc. And they're extended across time. So it's not just one brief and confusing episode, according to Acts 1, uh, um, uh, uh, across a period of 40 days. Okay, so it's a sort of claim about which is quite difficult to be honestly mistaken. And so what about the other remaining uh, hypothesis that the apostles were lying or were deceivers? Um, this also is problematic uh, for a number of reasons, the chief among which is probably the fact that the early apostles, those who are purportedly witnesses of the resurrection, were willing to voluntarily undergo and endure hardships and dangers and sufferings and persecutions and, um, and so forth on account of their testimony that Jesus rose from the dead. And that goes a long way towards establishing that they were at least sincere in that belief. Um, what do the New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion? Why would they die for something they knew to be false? People will die for something they believe to be true, but no one dies for something they believe to be false. Um, the martyrs of Peter, Paul, and James, the son of Zebedee, and James, the Lord's brother, are particularly well attested. And even for those cases where you cannot establish with confidence that they were in fact martyred, we do have evidence of their willingness to suffer persecution and face dangers and hardships on account of their testimony of the resurrection. So that helps to establish their sincerity in that belief. And so William Paley is quite correct, uh, as he puts it so eloquently, that there is satisfactory evidence that many professing to be original witnesses of the Christian miracles passed their lives in labors, dangers, and sufferings, voluntarily undergone in attestation of the accounts which they delivered, and solely in consequence of their belief of those accounts, and that they also submitted from the same motives to new rules of conduct. Um, Notice also the disciples' change of heart relating to this. Uh, given Peter's behavior on Thursday evening, his threefold denial, why would he suddenly change his mind by Saturday night and decide to start an elaborate hoax that would involve lifelong continued association with Jesus' name based on a deliberate conspiracy? The same could be said of the other disciples who all forsook Jesus and fled in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so in conclusion then, we've seen that we possess testimony from apostolic eyewitnesses. We focused in particular on Luke, but we could make a case for the others as well, that Jesus rose physically from the dead and appeared to them alive. Um, so we showed that Luke was present with, with Paul in Acts 21. He met the leaders of the Jerusalem church, which would have included Peter, James, and John. Luke was present with Paul for two years uh, in Caesarea Maritima and would have had access to those living witnesses of the resurrection. He was in a position to know what the witnesses were saying, which accords with his prologue, which is that he received information from 
eyewitnesses. Um, and so Luke is in a position to be giving us accurate information about what the disciples said. The content of the apostolic testimony makes it enormously improbable that they were deceived because they are multi-sensory in character involving multiple sensory modes, uh, group sightings, group conversations, physical contact, being extended across a long period of time, involving eating with Jesus, and so forth. The circumstances of the apostolic testimony makes it enormously improbable that they were deceivers because of their willingness to suffer dangers and hardships and persecutions on account of their claim. And therefore, I would contend that the most probable explanation is that the content of their testimony is true. And of course, this is just the pinnacle of the iceberg that we've covered this evening. There's a lot more to the story. Um, and if you want uh, some further reading, I, of course, recommend William Paley's book, A View of the Evidence of Christianity, or John Kennedy's book, The Resurrection of Jesus Christ, and historical with an examination of actualistic hypotheses. Um, and I will finish there. And thanks for your attention. Awesome. Thank you for that. I really appreciate the uh, the thoughtful slideshow. Um, for those for those watching, if you have any questions uh, for Jonathan, please uh, put those into the chat. If you preface it with question, I will see that faster. If you want to put it as a uh, super chat, um, I appreciate that. And that would get you to the front of the line, obviously, as uh, we go. Um, so, so, I, I mean, I was listening to that. So I, I have a few questions for you, but some of them are, so some of, some of, my, some of them I have, I have some thoughts and I'm going to try to form them into questions. I was trying to think about kind of how to ask them um, as they were going. I think my biggest concern slash question, I'm not sure, I'm going to form this terribly. So let me give you my thoughts and maybe you can help me, uh, you know, formulate the question to you. Um, and it's, it's something that was a similar problem for me when, uh, when I was still doing apologetics um, with the minimal facts also. And that is that a lot of the information um, that's, that's used to argue for the conclusion seems very, very indirect. Um, not just ancillary, but very indirect. So like, for example, a lot of the, you know, you, you spend a lot of time on the data about um, Luke uh, and, and, and showing, you know, kind of these, these undesigned coincidences around his, his traveling with Paul. And when, you know, when Timothy was going, um, I, I pulled up the Greek and, I, and, and I, I have some questions about that relationship between 1 Corinthians 4 and 1 Corinthians 16 anyways, um, because I think the undesigned coincidence relies on a tense um, that might not be this, that, that, that tense dis dis distinction just isn't there in the Greek. Um, but, but besides that, so how, how would you go about to responding to someone like me who says, and I know you get this, I've seen comments like this, that just say, well, but, but that just is so in like, why can't you just, why, why can't there just be data to prove the resurrection more directly? Does that, does that question kind of make sense? So I, I think that uh, the evidence that I'm talking about does bear directly on the resurrection. So let me explain uh, the structure of the argument that I was presenting. Um, so uh, I was showing that Luke uh, is someone who was in a position to know what the apostles were claiming. Uh, and there's an avalanche of evidence that indicates this to be the case. Uh, there's, it's pretty, it's essentially very well established that the author of Luke Acts uh, was a traveling companion of Paul. The, the evidence for that is, is overwhelming to the point of being completely conclusive. Um, that being the case, uh, Luke was present with Paul in Acts 21 when L Paul met with the Jerusalem leaders, including Peter, James, John. And, and so he was in a position to know what the apostles were claiming. Uh, and so that is relevant directly to the question of whether Jesus rose from the dead, because it helps to establish, okay, what were the apostles claiming uh, so that we can determine uh, the extent to which they were rational in their interpretation of what they allegedly experienced. Does that make sense? It, 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 do, it does. Um, I, I, you know, I, I still, I still wonder about the, the, the indirectness of it. I also wonder if, and, and maybe walk me through this a little bit more, um, because this, this is an issue that I, that I've generally had with, um, kind of resurrection apologetics again, even when I was a believer is that there seems to be, a, um, an equivocation between 
there seems to be kind of a a, a, a a shoving in of all the apostles into the apostles, right? So, um, and, you know, I, I ask this question a lot when it comes uh, to Barnabas and Thaddeus and, you know, James the Younger, uh, you know, and it kind of all of these, all these extra apostles that we don't know what happened to them. outside of actually some of these outside of their calling and being present, you know, just kind of indirectly in some of the, 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 the ministry of Jesus, we don't know what happened to, to most of them. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, with, without going too far into, you know, into, into those weeds, my question becomes like, how do we know that they were all there? Let's, let's say at the, at the Jerusalem church, right? When, when Paul goes there and, and what is it, uh, you know, late, late forties, mid, mid to late forties. Um, by that time, you know, he, he only mentions that he met with, with Peter, uh, James, it's questionable what James that was. Um, and so, you know, my, my question at that point is, how how do we then bank on that like this was like some universal experience of the the apostles like how do how do we know barnabas wasn't like wait you guys are claiming what like no i'm 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 out of i'm out of here like how do we know that like if, you know thaddeus didn't apostatize or you know didn't didn't leave shortly after that and the the, the first sign of persecution he was like yeah i'm done <laughs> like I, I i guess we we don't i i don't know how we how we have how we how we get away from something like that yeah. Okay. Good questions. Um, so, uh, first of all, I don't think that there's really any question about which James we're talking about because James the son of Zebedee is already dead by this point, right? In Acts 12, and uh, in Galatians, Paul is quite clear that he's talking about James, uh, the brother of Jesus, right? Is he, he, that's what he calls him. When in Galatians one, he men- he mentions. Uh, uh, that he's none of the other apostles, just James, the Lord's brother, and he doesn't disambiguate him from from uh, from the the James uh, that he um, alludes to as uh, being the leaders of the Jerusalem church in Galatians two. Um, there is also um, First but Corinthians have, fifteen. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, but but so the, 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 that's my question. Like, do we have? How do we get then to that James, the brother, right? Because I understand how you could you could possibly get the apostles from the upper room. How do we get that James, mm-hmm. the brother of Jesus, was an eyewitness? Um, so for well, first Corinthians 15, I wouldn't say that, uh, the experience of James would be the most compelling of them because, uh, first Corinthians 15 doesn't give us a lot of information about exactly the nature of James's experience. However, what I would say is that the gospel accounts and acts give us a sense of what the nature of the claimed experiences were like. And so, um, in first Corinthians 15, when it tells us, uh, that he, so it says that for delivered to, um, to you as the first importance, what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he appeared to Kephas, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of them are still alive, the some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Um, and so the experiences prior to, to Paul's, which occurred uh, in an untimely fashion, as he says, because it was after the ascension, um, are of the nature that we read of in in the gospel accounts and we can uh, we know that luke was a traveling companion of paul and so it would have been very surprising luke's understanding of the resurrection experiences were very different from from that of uh, paul um so um uh, it's uh, uh, first Corinthians 15 is explicit that james had uh, an experience that uh that w- of the risen jesus following his death and um we understand that Peter, James, and John were the leaders of the Jerusalem church in Galatians. And Acts is very explicit that all the leaders of the Jerusalem church were present in Acts 21. So um, as for as to your other point about um, how, how we know um, that the only uh, 11 apostles uh, were proclaiming in one accord the resurrection, um, uh, even though the Acts, the narrative in Acts only focuses on a small subset of them, um, in particular, Peter, um, John, uh, James, the son of Zebedee, uh, and the Apostle Paul, of course. Um, what I would say to that is, first of all, of all in Acts 2.14, we're explicitly told that the 11 were standing up with Peter and endorsing uh, his message on Pentecost. That's what the text explicitly says. Which, and which- Sorry, which text? Acts? This is in Acts 2, verse 14. Um, and immediately following Peter's speech, uh, people start asking, 
what they need to do in light of his speech uh, in Acts 237. And this is said, according to Acts 237, to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, which in the context must include all the other 11. Um, if you look at verse 14. Um, and this indicates that the, the 12 began, to, began uh, by speaking boldly on Pentecost um, and that they were planning to um, have an important ongoing leadership role in the early Christian movement, which also, by the way, is implied in Acts 1 because they, they vote for um, re replacing, G replacing Judas, who had died, with Matthias because uh, they wanted there to be 12 uh, apostles, 12 disciples that were going to be witnesses to the resurrection. And part of the qualification for being an apostle was that they had been with Jesus right from the beginning. Uh, and, so this, uh, and so that's also, I think, uh, of evidential value. So, um, um, and, and, and so this, um, this leadership role that they were to have was um, to be focused on testifying specifically to the resurrection of Jesus. And in fact, by boldly proclaiming the resurrection at Pentecost specifically, the 12 were already undertaking a tremendous risk um, um, on account of their message, right? This was only 50 days following uh, the death of Jesus uh, by crucifixion at the instigation of the Jewish leaders. Um, and uh, in fact, um, Peter's st statements in that text are actually quite uh, confrontational. And uh, you, know, you crucify the Lord of glory. And in Acts 5.28, um, um, and God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, the Lord in Christ, he, mentioned, he says. Um, in Acts 5.28, the leaders show that they are they, that they very well understood this confrontational message because they accused the apostles of trying to bring that this man's blood upon us. And so within just a month and a half of the crucifixion, the 12 were standing up boldly at Pentecost and they were publicly accusing those responsible for Jesus' death of murder. Um, and then you continue reading through the book of Acts and we see that um, they continue to serve as witnesses despite the conducts of persecution. Um, and uh, um, although the term apostles can have a broader usage in texts that are depicting leadership, uh, a leadership testifying role, um, when we find that the word apostles in the plural, we sh it should be taken uh, at least to include the 12 within uh, the, uh, when the context permits a group of, of that size, um, or when we have reason to, to think that the group uh, involved is, is smaller in number as when only Peter and John are brought before the leaders to involve uh, a smaller um, subset out of the 12. Um, but the book of Acts doesn't give us any reason at any point to think that uh, some members of the 12, some have abandoned their mission or apostatized from the faith uh, in the face of persecution. Um, so, well, yeah, go well, ahead. I guess I, just, you know, I, I, I have a, a, lots of questions then about that because of course. if, let's just say for the sake of argument, <clears throat> Peter made it, Peter is the one dishonest one, right? Mm -hmm. he, he goes back, tries to convince the, the apostles what they see. I, what we have in Acts, like like this is this is where I said it's indirect. Establishing that Luke was a traveling companion to Paul is is all fine and well, but it only really gets you you know him in front of uh, of, of of Peter, James, who wasn't an eyewitness, and then John, who well as you know, there's other dis disagreements there. But if if let's let's just imagine, yeah, you know, I'm not you said that James wasn't an eyewitness. What James was, I'm not sure that James was an eyewitness of the resurrection. Well, that's what first Corinthians 15 says, and Paul knew James personally, so that would seem likely, but that's the, the that's the claim, right? So, so the, this is this is where I this is where I go back to this, this is what I was leading up to my question, right? So, I'm, I'm not sure that that because Acts says, right, so that that the 11 were there preaching with the 11, right? Paul wasn't there. Um, if it's the 11, it's not clear that James was there because James wasn't one of the, one, wasn't one of the apostles. Maybe he was there and, and, and traveling with them. But we, but we, but we have evidence in the big of Acts for James's, uh, not having apostatized. Right. Um, so, so that wouldn't be relevant to the, the argument there. But so it doesn't, James is explicitly mentioned in Acts present among all the apostles all the time either. Right. right so, we, so it, but, we, but yeah. it seems that in order to make the case work, I already have to, I, I already kind of have to grant, and, and, and I'm not saying this as like a, like a super skeptic. I don't have a problem with, you know, the New Testament being largely historical. I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, uh, you know, I'm some type of mythicist or, you know, anything like that. 
but it seems to me that in order to get some of these details out, we kind of already have to presume that the testimony that's being given is already reliable. Um, because the, on the only way that we know what happens, say, in the upper room um, or, or in those proclamations is from the book of Acts. But the book of Acts is already multiple testimony, is already multiple people removed, right? The, the author is writing it through Paul. Paul maybe got it from, from um, James and Peter, and James and Peter are, are then, you know, possibly the eyewitnesses if that's the case. But now we're, we're already a couple chains of command down, down the way. Does that, does that make sense? No, actually. Um... So we ha we have evidence from the book of so the argument is not presupposing that the testimony uh, of the book of Acts is correct concerning what the experiences were like. Rather, it's saying this is what the witnesses the alleged witnesses claimed. Right, that's the that's the first part of the argument. And then but the the, witnesses, yeah. but hold on, but the alleged witnesses don't claim that on on the day of Pentecost, Peter was standing up with the eleven. Right, the author of Acts. That's what Luke claimed. tells us. Right, so the author of Acts tells us that. Correct. Right, but, but you need that to establish, right? So it, it's it seems that in order in order to get to the conclusion, we have to grant a lot of things. So the Book of Acts tells us that uh, not only that Peter was pre and and the other disciples were preaching at Pentecost fifty days after Jesus' death. It also tells us specifically about the nature and variety of the alleged experiences of the apostles in Luke twenty four. It also mentions it being extended across a forty day time period. Uh, and so, okay, so if if Luke tells us that he received information from eyewitnesses in Luke one and the prologue of Luke's gospel, and he we can show by the virtue of the argument that I adduced earlier that. Luke had access to witnesses of the resurrection. And we can show also his incredible attention to detail and meticulousness as an historian. I mean, he is just um, incredible as an, as an historiographer. That provides, I think, a, a good justification for thinking, okay, he's giving us a, an accurate representation of his understanding of what the apostles were claiming because he actually knew them personally. In fact, Luke himself is putting his own neck on the line, he's with Paul during these uh, persecutions, including during Paul's imprisonment in, in Caesarea and Rome and so forth. Um, and so he also, you, you could apply the argument from, from persecution to, to Luke as well, that he's uh, unlikely to be uh, making stuff up intentionally. I, I guess I'm not sure that that's the case, right? Because if, if Luke, if Luke was, was a traveling companion, like what, it doesn't seem like Luke experienced. I mean, we don't have any like, you know, persecution of Luke. Right. I mean, I, I mean, I generally think the persecution claims are, are overblown anyways that we don't really see. I, I mean, we see we see all kinds of, uh, of reason to think that 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 may not be the case. I mean, for the example, like in, in Acts 2 itself, I mean, what happens at Pentecost, um, you know, the, the, the apostles. Again, again, I'm not saying this is the, the reason or anything, but the, the, if you want a motivation, the apostles get their access to they get access to a lot of resources. Um, I mean, they, they the, the, the church having all things in common um, is, is a, you know, I, I understand the positive view of that, but it also on the flip side, on the dark side of that, you have a very, you have a, and, and it comes under the care of the apostles, um, to, to distribute and, and all that kind of stuff. So you, you have a very small number of people that get access to a large body of, of, uh, of land, property, food, wealth, all that kind of stuff. So it, it's, I'm I'm not entirely sure that that it's just they're 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 constantly at risk of persecution, or that they wouldn't have had a motivating reason to keep going in the face of persecution. Okay, so I mean the context of persecution seems to be very. Uh, I mean the the evidence for that seems to be quite uh, compelling. Uh, so you have the accounts in the Book of Acts uh, concerning the persecutions of the early Christians, uh, both from the Jewish authorities and then later from the Roman authorities. Uh, you have um, I mean, you've got the beheading of of, uh, of James by Herod Agrippa the First in Acts twelve. You've got the stoning of Stephen in Acts seven. You've got yeah, but we don't know why James was beheaded. I mean, be, J John, John the Baptist was beheaded by by Herod because he critiqued his marriage arrangements. Right? I mean, we we don't know if James you know just pissed off. Uh, Look, you know, as uh, you know, in, in apologetics, Herod is all the Herods. I know this isn't the same Herod as, uh, you know, as, this is uh, Herod, um, uh, not Herod Antipas. Which one is this one? Herod the Tetrarch. Um, 
Uh, so this is, uh, sorry, in, in Acts 12, this is Herod Agrippa the first. Yeah, Herod Agrippa, sorry. So, yeah. I, I, I mean, Her there, that's a, it's a, it's a bad dude. By, by all accounts, it's a bad dude. If you, it, you know, this is, this is the type of thing where like, if you talk bad about them, they, 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 you know, Pilate lies in waiting um, with his guards and slaughters hundreds of you and, and Herod Agrippa, you know, they he beheaded he beheaded John the Baptist and had his head on a platter served at a dinner party because he critiqued his you know his 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 marriage. It, it's not clear from Acts, I'll, I'll be honest, that from Acts 12, that James was killed by Herod for preaching the gospel, for example, or for being a Christian. Um, so you know, I, again, I, I it seems to me that a lot of the a lot of these factoids they get they get glosses in order to make them to make them work. As evidence, right? So, so when I so when I ask, for example, like, well, how do we know that none of the apostles apostatized, right? Because you need the, you need all the apostles to be willing to suffer for the faith. If you get if you have a couple that are that are like, yeah, I'm not going to do all this suffering. That line of argument doesn't work. But but how do you how do we know that none of them apostles? We have no maybe the fact that we know nothing about them, and the only people in in Jerusalem at the time it could be missionary journeys. It could because you know you're talking to Peter. Peter doesn't want to be like, yeah, they they bounced, they left, you know, they didn't, they weren't into this anymore. He could be like, oh, they're on a missionary journey, right? I, I mean, it it it's a it's a lot of information that that seems to be that it needs to be assumed in the backgrounds is what. And and again, I'm not I'm not just saying this as someone who's who's apostatizing now. Does like this was this was a lot of my my criticisms previously as well. Um, and and it's and it's not even saying the argument's false, right? It's just you know these these are the types of things that w without direct evidence, there's just there's so many it's there's so many plot holes that kind of need to be shored up. Does that again? I know this isn't a question, and I'm not asking you to like agree with me <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, but does that like does the sentiment? I mean, does it does it make sense as a sentiment that there's there's lots of these like shoring up and lots of lots of other questions that kind of has to be answered first. So would you agree that uh, the apostles uh, had a very credible risk of persecution, imprisonment, beatings, stonings, um, and or martyrdom on account of their proclamations of the resurrection? I mean, we see this all the way through Paul's letters where he instructs people, uh, Philippians 129, for example, to you it's been granted not only to live, believe in him, but also to suffer for his name. You see, um, this the, the Pauline corpus and other letters in the New Testament are riddled with instructions to bear up under persecution. And that doesn't make much sense unless there is, in fact, a general widespread persecution against the Christians, which is consistent with what we see in Acts. We have the at the imprisonment of Peter and John, for example, uh, in Acts 5 um, and, uh, and and so forth. Does that make sense? Maybe. Uh, I, I guess, you know, so, so, you know one, one of the things that I always look at is we, you have the super apostles, mm -hmm. right? You have you have you have you have the false teachers. You have all the, the all the ones who seem to want to attach themselves to the church movement, because let's be honest, religion makes money, right? And I'm not saying there's a critique of a religion. I don't think that's what makes it false. It just it attracts people who want to profit, and which that just intrinsically the fact that the Bible also says you have these you have these like super apostles that are doing it for fame and doing it for recognition and doing it for profit um and all that kind of stuff. it the flip side of that is it's not like everyone goes like oh if you become a christian like you're good you're going to get persecuted right sometimes i wonder if there's kind of an over selection bias that's happening right so because paul is being persecuted but when you look at what paul was doing <laughs> It reminds me of that old thing, like, you know, people aren't persecuting you because you're a Christian. People are persecuting you because you're being a jerk. Not that Paul was being a jerk, but in that atmosphere, being a political upstart and 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 looking like you're you're a challenge to the status quo, regardless of your ideology, is potentially asking for trouble, right? So so it 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 may be the case that in that context, right? Because we don't we don't have all these testimony of like, oh, well, you know, to the Corinthians, you all are just like blanket being persecuted right it it's very it's very very possible that that paul's trying to encourage them to be more uh i mean it's not like the corinthians were like the picture of a healthy church or anything like that um i, I you know i'd be i i 
I guess part of this is also, I'd be surprised based on the letter to the Corinthians, if the Corinthians were also the on fire church out there proclaiming Jesus on the street corners and getting in trouble all the time. So like him saying like, you know, you're experiencing persecution. Um, I don't, I, I just, I just don't know. That seems like it could just be a, you know, he, he's saying, look, if it, you're going to start doing these things. You, you know, you know, you bear up under persecution. You'll, you know, the the, the, Lord, the Lord has to say. Um, I'm not sure that that serves as evidence. You're not sure that it serves as evidence that Paul was willing to face persecution because that persecution uh, was widespread, and therefore all the apostles were experiencing but, persecution. But the question is why for 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 evidence so, for it. how do we know when when we say things like the the circumstances make it improbable that they're deceivers well we don't we don't know yeah, the I mean, circumstances for most why, of them. why were why were the apostles upset in the apple car and challenging the status quo because they believed jesus rose from the dead and they were boldly proclaiming that uh in the midst of persecution that there were there was a credible threat of persecution jesus their leader their teacher had just been himself crucified uh and uh and we see throughout the book of Acts when, that uh, preaching the gospel angers a lot of people, um, both from the Jewish side as well as from the Roman side, and that results in persecution. And we see this, um, all the the, um, the 11 are included in many of those uh, references uh, in, in Acts. I can give examples, but so I, I don't really find uh, that particular critique to be very uh, convincing as a, as a kind of rebuttal. I, I guess, though, I, I'm still back to the that that right because that relies on the narrative already being accurate to the actual state of affair on the ground right it wh why why couldn't it be the case for example i mean the, the common cliche his you know history is written through the lens of the victors right mm -hmm. we know we know that texts are we know that texts like this are theologized we know the texts like this present a very especially at this time, a very lopsided view, let's just put it that way, of what was happening. They're, they're written for polemical purposes. They're written to advance certain causes. I mean, Luke, it's, he's writing to Theophilus um, to, to defend the certain thesis. Now, again, I'm not saying, therefore, it makes him unreliable. I'm not, I'm not one of those people that like, oh, well, show me a source that isn't written by a Christian to a Christian conclusion. Well, I mean, if someone thinks that it's true, they're going to think that it's true. Like, that, like, I'm not, I get it. But at the same time, it also is going to have a. It's also going to have a slant to it. So, so then, I mean, just just to give a few examples from from the Pauline Corpus, where Paul uh, attests to the broader context of persecution. Um, so, uh, for example, he writes to the Christians in Thessalonica in Second Thessalonians one verses four and five. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the church of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. He writes to the Christians in Rome, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Um, that's in Romans 5, 3 and 4. Uh, he also uh, writes in Romans 8, uh, who, uh, Romans 8, uh, 35 and 36, who shall separate us from the love of Christ or tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Um, to, and uh, as I mentioned earlier to the Christians of Philippi, he writes in Philippians 1, 29 and 30, for it has been granted to you for the, uh, that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaging in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. And so that and many other texts seems to imply that there is this general context of persecution uh, of the, of the uh, Christian movement. Uh, and indeed, uh, I mean, Tacitus in his Annals of Imperial Rome mentions that in shooting from the fire in 64, there was a general persecution against the Christians at the behest of Nero, the emperor, to deflect the blame away from himself. And uh, although that was a political motivation more so than a theological motivation, nonetheless, the early apostles were proclaiming uh, the truth of Christianity um, in the midst of danger of potential uh, persecution and martyrdom. Okay. Uh the the other one of the I I want to I want to keep going on um, just for, for those watching um, we're probably only going to go for like another ten minutes or so I think you know we said we said about right around seven seven to five uh, you had a you had a cut off um, I may keep going afterwards but um, if you have a question for Jonathan uh, please put it in the in the chat um, and I'll get to it I've seen a couple of questions come through that I'll bring up Braxton Hunter from Trinity Radio said hi he loves us we love you too uh, well I don't know Jonathan might not love you but I'm sure he does. Um, uh, but but I love you, Braxton. Um, 
I, so I, I had one more, I had one more question and, and it, it goes towards kind of my example, you know, my, my questions of general um, statements that are made in this that, that, that I've, um, you know, take exception with. Um, but for those watching, if you have questions, please get the questions in um, and we'll get those um, to, to Jonathan here uh, shortly. Um, my, my, again, observation question type of thing is, you know, I, I commonly hear the, you know, no one dies, no one dies for a lie. Um, and I mean, I can think of all kinds of examples to the contrary of that. Um, so I guess, you know, I know that's a common saying in, 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 you know, arguments for the reliability, um, of the apostolic testimony, um, about, about the resurrection, how, like how, how tightly or, or exactly do you take that type of saying, um, and, and it, you know, do you th see it as a general rule of thumb, but exceptions don't bother you? Or do you think that, you know, there, there are no, like what type of stock do you put into claims like that? So I'd say that a willingness to uh, suffer persecution um, and, uh, and particularly martyrdom is evidence that tends to confirm sincerity in that, in the sense that uh, willingness to endure persecutions and hardships and dangers, et cetera, is more probable on the hypothesis of sincerity than it is otherwise. Um, and I, I think it goes a very long way towards establishing sincerity. Um, so I do I do think that there are many examples, if any, of someone that dies for something that they, be, they believe to be false. You, you don't think there are examples or you just think that there, there are not very many? Um, if there are examples, there aren't very many, but I'm not aware of any examples. So if, maybe you have some. But in any case, even if there were some examples, uh, it would still carry, I think, significant evidential value in confirming uh, sincerity. Well, so, so I mean, I, I can think of examples of you know uh, uh, during during extreme circumstances, war, or whatever. You might you might have people, you know, parents that are willing to um, uh, to take on you know their 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 children might be accused of some type of war crime. They they say that they did it, and they're willing to take punishment for their kids, right? I I, I think that it. I, I agree with you that if you're willing to die for a lie, it shows sincerity. I'm not sure that it shows that the 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 claim you make that arrives at the death you believe is true. You may just believe that sincerely it's the right thing to do. Um, uh, I, I think that might be a more, a more moderate version of what, of what that type of cliche is, is, is going for. I don't know what you think about that. So you would contend then that the apostles were dying not for their belief in the resurrection per se, but rather for their belief in the moral teachings. Is that essentially what you're saying? It could be the moral teachings. It could be. It could be the value. Of it. I, I mean, I'm not. I'm not fully convinced that people won't. Uh, people are stubborn. Uh, I'm not sure that there aren't some people who would who would knowingly die um, for things that they have. You know, less. I mean, I, I. I think if we went through, you know, just just Amer just American criminal justice system, uh, you know, throughout history or, or or otherwise, we might have all kinds of people that are that are willing to die for um, very stubborn reasons. Uh, but I, but I think, but I think at the at the very least, even if I were to grant something, I would say, well, uh, may, maybe they had altruistic reasons. They they thought that it was valuable. They thought maybe that it was that it really was ushering in the kingdom. Um, you know, they they seemed to think that Jesus was coming back imminently, um, and so maybe the you know their their deaths um, ushered that. There there could be all kinds of reasons um, that you can go towards sincerity, but I don't think it necessarily gets you to therefore. Um, well. The, I mean yeah, in the ahead. case in the case of the Apostle Paul, I mean, clearly he thought that everything righted on the resurrection. That's very clear and apparent from First Corinthians 15. If Christ is not raised, then we're still in our sins, and um, we're to be, of all men most to be pitied. Uh, so evidently for him, uh, everything rested on the veracity of the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, when we look at, at the changed lives of the of the apostles, in particular Peter, who betrayed Jesus um, on the night of his uh, arrest, uh, the night of his um, his arrest uh, by betray by denying him three times. Um, and then uh, you, you see very shortly thereafter, he's a, a changed man. So, so crucified was he, so, so terrified was he of crucifixion that he denied the Lord three times. And now he's transformed into someone who is willing to, to put his neck out for, for Christ, even to the point of death and, uh, and martyrdom. Uh, and so that, that I think is surprising, uh, on that hypothesis. Um, we also, of course, throughout the early Christian writing, uh, 
uh, we we see a condemnation of of lying and deceit, and so that doesn't seem to be very uh, consistent with uh, Christian values. If they were simply dying for the moral message, in any case, if they were making the resurrection now, because it's very clear from the historical record that the early apostles were not just. I mean, they were they were actually claiming that Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, why even go to the bother of claiming the resurrection uh, when it wasn't even part of the messianic Jewish expectation? In any case, it, it seems rather surprising to me. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, I, 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 I'll I'll give my my final thought. Give yours, and then see if there's any 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 final questions. Uh, because I'm not I'm not convinced that it wasn't part of any type of messianic um, expectation. Um, you know, I'm not. This is this is this is not my biggest area of of research. So uh, you know, I'm 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 going provisionally based on you know what I what I what I've heard from from others in the, in, in that have researched. Um, so you know, if if this is just categorically wrong. Um, but it, but it does seem that there, in in, in Second Temple Judaism, I, I mean the 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 messianic understanding. It's not that there was like a single a single understanding of it. I mean Second Temple Judaism was pretty variegated, um, and so I, I, you know I I'm not thoroughly convinced that when when we can say things like this thing was just completely unexpected um, in in Second Temple Judaism, especially considering. Um, especially the, let, let's let's imagine that 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 it was new with the Christian movement, which I, which I'm not entirely sure that it was. It, if if the gospels are accurate to to Jesus, to, I mean Jesus was was preaching this leading up to his death, right? He 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 was a second temple Jew. He 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 was actually even if he, whether he's the the creator of it or not, prior to their belief in the resurrection, you have a second temple Jewish you know, pro, pre, uh, prophet and preacher who was making this, who was making this claim um, and, and setting the expectation um, that the later apostles would then Im embody and imbibe. Right. So, so even if it wasn't common or even if it wasn't common or wasn't present in other sects, it, it certainly predated the, the apostolic testimony. But my, the, the only point I was trying to make was that, uh, uh, if they were trying to, if if they didn't actually believe the resurrection themselves, and they were trying to get as many Jews on board with this Christian movement, then the resurrection seems an unlikely uh, way to uh, um, achieve that aim, because that, that just wasn't on the messianic expectation of what the Messiah um, was supposed to be. Um, so, I, um, so I, I, I just don't find that um, that line of uh, rebuttal very convincing. Well, okay. I, I said I was going to be last. So I could, I could, we could go on this for, for hours. Maybe I'll have you back on another time to talk about messianic expectations and things like that. But I wanted to get to, um, there were a couple of questions that, that came through that I want to get to. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to discuss, but um, Jamie asks, uh, can we uh, hear some of the undesigned coincidences and hear some back and forth? We probably won't get to back and forth. Um, but I, I know you mentioned some undesigned coincidences uh, to get uh, Luke in the presence of Paul and some of those. But, but besides that, there, there are. I, I actually find undesigned coincidences to be very, very interesting. I know some people think they're, you know, just dismiss them uh, as as artifacts that are later imposed. I don't think so. I think they're actually very interesting uh, historical markers. Um, what is like your of, of of undesigned coincidences generally? Maybe not even just towards the resurrection, but just historical. What's like your favorite undesigned coincidence? <laughs> like the the hometown at the the feeding of the five thousand, or you know, what's the what's the big one for you? Um. I think my, my, so in the Gospels are Acts. <laughs> Any of them, your favorite. Let, let's stick with Acts because that's kind of the, the, you okay. know, the relevant book for this. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite one in Acts would be the one that I gave first uh, in the presentation, which would be uh, the relationship between First Corinthians and Acts in relation to sending of Timothy up through to Raza Macedonia on his way around to Corinth. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, question. Oh, this is too long to put on. I don't know if I can get it on there. Uh, he says, question, Tyler, what do you think of the apostles' use of Old Testament passages to prove to the Jews of their own uh, Christ's resurrection? How does the harmony of the whole scripture even kindle a spark of doubt? I uh, didn't get the entire question. So um, I think that largely what's happening um, when the New Testament cites Old Testament passages um, is... Uh, sometimes very ad hoc. Um, sometimes it's very creative on, on how it gets there. Um, and I think that it, I, I think that there are some that are some that are rather vague. Um, and I think that there are some that are very interesting. 
Um, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I guess my, my approach is generally um, that there isn't a kind of cookie cutter there, you know, they're all ad hoc or they're all vague or they're all, you know, but, but I do find that in a, in a lot of ways, the way that they are being used when you study through um, is not in, always entirely hermeneutically clear. So like what's happening, um, for example, when Matthew cites Hosea 12 uh, about, you know, out of Egypt, I call my son. Hosea 11. Uh, Sorry, Jose eleven. Um, so there, there are there are some you know those where uh, exegetically and hermeneutically, if we tried to read the Old Testament that way, uh, every New Testament scholar would be up in arms uh, about, uh, or Old Testament scholar would be up in arms about handling that way. So uh, I, I think they're I think they're interesting, um, but I don't I don't necessarily find them as uh, compelling. Um, and again, this is also this is not necessarily an apostolic thing, uh, or, or sorry, a, a, an apostate thing. Um, I, uh, there, there's also a reason why I didn't, uh, do a lot of like, you know, arguments from prophecy or fulfilled prophecy, even during my apologetics ministry. So, uh, John, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. And then just, I, I think uh, because I, I know we're close on your time. Sure. Um, just briefly, um, you mentioned Hosea 11, one specifically New Testament use of the old Testament, by the way, is a topic of long time fascination for me. So, um, pity this uh, came up towards the end of our conversation, but, um, just briefly on, uh, Hosea 11, one, uh, and Matthew's use of it. The, um, so what's Matthew doing with Hosea 11, 1 in Matthew 2? So he quotes it when Jesus is fleeing from Herod the Great during the slaughter of the infants, and Jesus and, G and Mary and Joseph flee to Egypt. And uh, what he's doing, I think, is what he also does in Matthew 4. So in Matthew 4, we've got the wilderness narrative where um, Jesus in the wilderness of 40 days, and that, of course, reminds us of Israel's sojourn in the wilderness, fasting and being tested or tempted for 40 years. And Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 8, the very text that deals with Israel's 40-year uh, sojourn in the wilderness. Imagine not live by bread alone, but every but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what Matthew's doing is he's representing Jesus as the new and greater Israel, the one who succeeds where Israel failed. And that is an idea that uh, comes from the Old Testament itself. For example, Isaiah 49, which is a clearly messianic text. I don't have time to get into why, but uh, in Isaiah 49, verse 3, it identifies the Messiah by the title Israel. He said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. And yet in verse 5 and 6, distinguishes this individual from national Israel. Israel. So he is a true Israel. And so that is, I think, why Matthew uh, quotes Hosea 11, 1, out of Egypt have called my son. In context, yes, it's dealing with the exodus, the, the exodus from Egypt of the nation of Israel. But um, Matthew applies it to Jesus because he is a true Israel who succeeds where Israel failed. Yeah. So I, I so you, you said it much more eloquently than I did. Um, I, I, I do think that a lot of times what's happening in the New Testament, um, the, the reason why I don't find it like interesting in the sense of like fulfilled prophecy is I think, and, and what's happening all the time is that there is this, they're, they're, they're looking for these ways that Jesus is arc is archetypally fulfilling or thematically fulfilling something that's found in the old Testament. Um, so I, I, I think it's ad hoc in that sense that they are going to look for these things. I don't necessarily think they are like prophecies where, you know, the, the, you know, the, there's a prophecy that happens here and there's like a little like, you know, cannonball that flies through history and then like lands on Jesus. I think they're, they're looking for these archetypal um, or the thematic fulfillments and they're finding them in the old Testament. So, um, so with that, uh, I don't know if you had any uh, final, final comments that you'd like to share. I'll give you the, the last word, where can people find you um, and, uh, and any final thoughts? Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. You can find me again at jonathanmcclatchy.com and also check out my other website, talkaboutdoubts.com if you would like to have private conversations with PhD level experts on various topics relating to uh, the Bible, science, philosophy, theology, et cetera, uh, if you have big doubts about the Christian faith. And uh, yeah, I'm thankful, grateful for this conversation and look forward to speaking again some other awesome. time. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining. Uh, I'm going to keep the live going for a little bit of time. If there's any questions, um, I have some secondary topics uh, to cover as well. Um, so if you all would like to stay on, I also put the join. If anyone wants to come on stage and have a conversation, uh, definitely feel free. But Jonathan, thank you so much for joining. Um, it's been it's been great having you on, and I look forward to further discussions with you. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a great night. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to keep this live going. Um, I had a, a couple other uh, secondary comment or uh, 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 things to uh, to deal with and, and to look at, um, and so I wanted to go through some of those. Uh, I did put in the chat the uh, the Streamyard live. Um, I know some of you like to join. I know Jamie, you like to join on if you're able to. 
uh, right now. Oh, he said he's not at home. That's all right. Um, don't know if anyone wanted to join in and have a, a discussion here, but you're definitely uh, more than welcome to join in. I'm going to pull up. Um, I had a couple of videos um, that I thought about going through. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. I wanted to, I'm going to respond to, there's a video, um, that is put out by, uh, Great Light Studios. Um, and this is what he thinks is a major critique of Calvinism, um, and what Calvinism gets wrong about, about faith. Again, I'm no longer a Calvinist. Um, I'm, you know, not here to, uh, to defend Calvinism as true or anything like that. It just is an area of, of study for me. It's still an area of interest for me. Uh, I find it fascinating, which by the way, I, I did want to, um, I did want to talk actually a little bit about, and, and that is that, that people seem to think that when someone leaves the faith, they're suddenly just going to think that it's pointless to talk about or that it's, uh, you know, why talk about anything at all? Why care what's happening? Uh, all that kind of stuff, you know, um, which is weird uh, because in, in a lot of disciplines, it'd be like saying, um, well, because, you know, uh, someone doesn't believe in, in all of the Greek myths, Therefore, they shouldn't care about about you know uh, about reading Homer and understanding Homer and the debates dealing with, you know, dialectical approaches to Homer and 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 the the philosophical and the historical underpinnings of Homer and the impact of Homer on later literature and and all those types of things, right? When when we're when when we're dealing with such an important body of literature as the the Bible is and has been and historically has impacted Western culture, Western literature, Western I mean pretty much all of Western uh, civilization uh, has been just impacted and infused uh, by the Bible. Um, I think it's one of the um, uh, the greatest literary uh, uh, works um, of Western civilization as well. Um, again, there may be some atheists that are like, well, how can you say that? Cause it has like these horrible, you know, moral things in it that, that, you know, you, you can think that that's fine. I, I also think there, there, there are passages that I think are terrible. Uh, but I, I also think literarily it's beautiful and there are beautiful themes into it. And it's, it's a masterpiece of literature. And I, you know, I, I we can think all of those things at the same time. So, you know, I don't, I don't understand why people are, are so dismissive of it. Um, it, you know, without being able to, to really study it. So that, that's why I'm still interested in these topics. So um, especially, you know, reform theology and Calvinism, I spent so, so long um, studying it. It's a, it's still an area of, of study and interest for me. I still, you know, since I still study the Bible and think that, that Calvinism is, um, uh, you know, the, the closest to an accurate systematic of, of the Bible that, that can reasonably be done consistently. Um, again, I don't think the Bible is consistent. I think it has um, inconsistencies and incompatibilities and contradictions. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me that there are exception passages uh, to things, especially when you're going from author to author or Old Testament to, to, to New Testament. Um, but it still is an area of interest. And so when, and, and it's an area where I, you know, I have the, you know, most of my study dealing with. So it annoys me still in these conversations when we could be having robust conversations uh, and people are still on about, you know, oh, well, Calvinism makes us robots and still makes us same. I am still going to to uh, say, you know, I'm still going to defend Calvinism from crappy objections, but that doesn't mean that I'm defending Calvinism or I'm an advocate of Calvinism or anything like that. I have actually, I, I've done quite a few posts and I've, I've been defending Arminianism from, from Calvinists who, who say things like Arminianism is work-based and it's, you know, it's Pelagian and all those types of uh, ridiculous things, uh, or even people who say, you know, provisionists uh, are are, you know, I, I had someone say, um, provisionists are, uh, they didn't call them Gnostics, but it was a similar type of thing. They're like, oh, pro provisionists are, uh, now I can't remember it. Uh, oh, pro, uh, ah, I can't remember. But it was similar to the type of like, oh well, you know, Calvinists are Gnostics. It was a similar type of like, oh well, provisionists are Gnostics, uh, and which is just dumb. It's just it, it, they're they're just they're just categorically not that. Um, I don't think that they are exegetically responsible for their own biblical passages. I think they're inconsistent. I think they don't understand the the their opponents. I think you know they they have, have a really hard time uh, understanding other views in light of the 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 concepts and the framework of other views. I think they have a hard time not filtering it through their own, 
their own positions, but you know, um, it, it is what it is. So that's why I'm still going to have conversations about Calvinism and Reformed theology. I'm still going to have conversations about dispensationalism and Old Testament theology and provisionism and libertarian free will and open theism. I, I find these topics interesting. Um, I think that they are important to understanding what's happening in biblical text, to what's happening, um, you know, in the broader in the broader context. And Christianity is a huge force in our culture. Um, it matters what is happening in Christendom. Um, I, you know, I, I've, I've said multiple times that I think uh, evangelical Christianity, um, specifically of the fundamental far right side, which I've started calling uh, uh, con, uh, conservagel conservagelicalism, um, because it's not, not all evangelicals are this way, not all conservatives are this way, but there's this weird melting pot of uh, very far right uh, evangelicalism um, that seems to, to be more um, conserv more far right uh, conservative social reconstructionist than they are Christian. Um, and then they, you know, they, they care more about Trump's policies um, than they do about, you know, keeping the great commission, for example, um, those types of things impact our culture. They impact my life. Uh, they impact my kid's life. They impact the type of society they're going to grow up into. They, Im they impact those things. So it's important um, to have these discussions. And I still think that they're important. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to me um, that, that it seems like evangelicalism is going towards its own type of Copernican, Copernican shift um, similar to happened in, in the Protestant Reformation. You know, I, I would not be surprised in the next 75 years uh, you know, evangelicalism, Protestantism is already so fractured and split um, for good or for ill. Uh, it would not be surprised me if a lot of the moderate middle atrophied um, and we see a lot more of the polarization, which we're already seeing in other spheres uh, of life as well. So it wouldn't surprise me if we see, you know, pr uh, progressive process, uh, you know, non-classical theism on the one hand, uh, you know, foster uh, and, and kind of reformed Lutheran um, uh, uh, you know, classical theists on the other side of Protestantism, and there be a, a large atrophy uh, in the middle. So, the, but those types of things, they matter to what's happening in our culture. They matter to what's happening in politics. They matter to what's happening in biblical studies. They matter to what's happening in philosophical studies. They, they, they have impact. So, I'm going to keep having these discussions uh, and and to studying these things. So, if people are not interested and don't know why someone who no longer believes would keep doing that. That's fine. Um, but, uh, you know, saying, well, you know, if you don't believe anymore, then it shouldn't matter. Like th th those aren't going to, those aren't going to change uh, the fact that I do have uh, these conversations. So uh, with that said, I am going to bring up uh, this video. Like always, um, I am going to play this at one and a half times speed this is not meant to make the person sound silly. I'm not trying to make them sound like a chipmunk. Um, it's just that I'm trying to get through uh, a about 13 minute video um, with my comments and not make it uh, an hour uh, and a half longer than than this is. Um, so again, if you'd like to, if you're listening and you'd like to join in the discussion, uh, I put the Streamyard uh, link in. I'll put it again uh, here. If anyone would like to join in, I'm happy to have the conversation derailed. I'm happy to have. Um, uh, more, more questions, uh, come in. Um, so feel free, but, uh, with that, I'm going to bring up this video. All right. Uh, if someone listening, I, I believe that the sound should be working, uh, just fine. Um, but if someone could tell me uh, in the comments, if something isn't working, that would be great. Uh, with that. So this is, uh, this is a, a certain channel, um, that is, uh, responding to Calvinists. They are, um, they are, I, from what I can tell, they are trying to be, whether it's intentional or not, they are, they're trying to be uh, similar to a kind of a, a soteriology 101, uh, provisionist perspectives. They are, you know, almost all the content is anti-Calvinistic, um, and, Really, it's built on the back of, oh, I heard this on YouTube from John Piper, and so therefore Calvinism gets this wrong. Um, they, you know, the 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 host seems to be a very nice guy. I don't think he, he you know, I, I don't think he's dishonest. I don't think he's, you know, I don't think he's a liar. Um, I think he sincerely thinks what he's saying, but I also think that he um, 
doesn't understand a lot of these things. I think he's getting a lot of his uh, kind of talking points and ideas from other anti-Calvinist sites, clipping the same videos that I'm seeing on other anti-Calvinist sites. <clears throat> I've asked him multiple times, um, you know, which, which can, you know, can you name any, you know, reform systematic theologian or, you know, systematic theology or confession or, you know, academic peer reviewed literature that's making these types of claims. And it's, well, no, John Piper said this in this one video one time um, that never really bodes well for someone really understanding these views. Um, and it's another one where typically everyone that I see responding to him who does understand these views say, you're getting it wrong. You don't understand. Um, but uh, similar to other provisionists uh, and uh, and other channels like this, um, it seems incorrigible to uh, actually listening and and doing the research uh, that's that's needed. So uh, with that, I'm going to jump in. So this is Calvinism is wrong about faith, um, and uh, and uh, we'll we'll walk through why this is uh, is such a problematic uh, hot take. Wix is your platform to perform on. So I'm going to continue on responding to, well, in my mind, I have specifically one comment that I've kind of been responding to in the past couple of videos, but really there's been sort of a conglomeration of comments centered around the same idea um, on some of my Calvinist videos. And those are coming from Calvinists who are, are kind of talking about this idea of faith. And if faith is something that we choose to have, then we are somehow adding to our salvation. So I'm going to continue on responding to that. And I have just a kind of a, a different uh, angle that I want to approach uh, this with um, in this video. All right, so what's going to happen? And I'm going to tell you the from from the outset the, the the reason why structurally, dialectically, this argument that he's going to give is going to fail. It's because he does a very typical uh, move uh, for those who don't um, understand their opponents and who um, are unable to understand opposing views from within those frameworks of the other views. What I mean by that is um, there is a common critique of provisionists and incorrectly of Arminians and, and other views that if those views are correct, then faith becomes a work, okay? The Calvinist is running an internal critique of the other view. Now, you might think that that internal critique fails. That's fine. I think in some cases that internal critique fails. In some cases, it doesn't. There are some views that I have to admit, uh, especially when you start getting into provisionism, and it comes down to if you are if you are good enough, if you are humble enough, if you are righteous enough, um, or you're, it, it, it starts getting pretty expressly um, Pelagian. And by the way, I say that not as a condemnation, not as a boogeyman. I don't care if someone's a Pelagian. Just taxonomically, that's what it is. It is a it is a uh, that, that's the type of view that it is. Um, but what the Calvinist is doing is they are doing an internal critique of that view. They are saying, if your view is true, then it makes faith into a work. And then your system, therefore, is work-based. Okay. They are not saying that is our view of faith. Okay, this is going to be very important to why this critique fails, because he is going to attribute to Calvinism the view that they are critiquing as an internal critique of another view. Right. So we'll, we'll see why this has become a problem uh, for for this video. So I think that when Calvinists argue that God must decisively cause us to have faith or else we are adding our own righteousness to salvation, then what they are demonstrating is a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of what faith is. That is not works. So faith, I think, is clearly described by Paul as something that whatever it is, we can talk about what it is. But one thing we know it not is not is works. I think that is. OK, so the Calvinists agree faith is not works. No Calvinist confession systematic theology, no reformed scholar, no reformed theologian is going to say faith is a work. Zero percent of them will say that. Okay. So th th this is why, so I'm going to, I'm going to reverse this again. So I think we're at what is it? 115. I'm going to reverse this a little bit. Remember, no Calvinist says that faith is a work. What they say is that if these other views are true, 
then they make faith into a work because they make the faith or, and really what a lot of Calvinists are trying to get at is they make the underlying action, they make the underlying uh, heart condition, the underlying desire, the underlying choice that goes into faith or brings about faith into something that then causes God to choose to save you back, right? That's why they say it's synergistic, right? So one of the things that, that I've always said is that it's it's better to talk about synergism and monergism in the sense of necess necessity and sufficiency, right? Monergism says that the work of God is not only necessary for, but is sufficient for election and salvation, okay? Synergism says that it's necessary for, right? A Pelagian is still going to say the work of God and grace is necessary for salvation, but they're, they're going to say it's not sufficient for. There has to be this other condition that's met. There has to be this other ingredient that's put into it. Whether or not you think that's good or bad, whether or not you think that's biblical or not biblical, that is the main distinction between synergism and monergism, it, it, just conceptually. Now, there are lots of traditions who are going to disagree with that, and they are going to say that they are monergistic. Roman Catholicism is going to say this, right? Uh, Lutheranism is going to is going to say this. There, there are lots of views that are going to say they are monergistic, but when a Reformed person says that they're monergistic, they are meaning that the, the grace of God, the work of the Holy Spirit is necessary and sufficient for salvation. Not simply that it's necessary for. That's going to be the difference. Now, that is a difference that's going to drive this, this, this critique. And it's one of the reasons why I think some Reformed criticisms of like Arminianism and Lutheranism and others fail because they are assuming a certain view of monergism. And so they're saying it doesn't fit my definition of monergism. And so therefore it's synergism. That is going to be a problem that plagues some of the, the reform critiques of these other views. But when they're talking about faith being a work, they are not saying that we think uh, that, that, that this is them. They're not saying that they think that faith qua faith is a work. Okay. I, by Paul as something that whatever it is, we can talk about what it is, but one thing we know it not is not is works. And so, so what, what you can't do to escape this is you can't say, well, <clears throat> you know, what, what he can't say is mystery reform. Your, your critique is that my, my system is work-based, but I say it relies on faith and faith just, but definitionally isn't of works, right? The Calvinist is still saying, no, but I, you, you still have to deal with the, the, the reformed objection to your view. Right, Lutherans have an easy way out of this. Arminians have an easy way out of this. Provisionists, is a lot of Anabaptist movements, a lot of kind of you know kind of uh, uh, theologically loose evangelical Arminians don't have a really easy way out of this. Right, it actually does seem like in some ways the way they define what faith is or the conditions that bring about faith as being an autonomous. Um, indeterminate, uh, you know, they, they, they are the ultimate cause, the, the, the agent is the ultimate cause of the condition that brings about faith. For a Reformed person, that is really going to, to, to rub a cord. They're really going to say, oh, well, that, that just is saying that that person can do something on their own apart from the working of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible means by works. You are doing something to, to, to merit, to cause God to choose you back, right? So, so, they're, so they're saying that is a problem. That's a work. You can't get away from it by saying, well, no, because I'm saying it's by faith and faith just isn't a work. So therefore it's not, right? That's not an escape to the criticism they're giving you. Again, their criticism might not be good. You might have a way around it, but this isn't a good, a way, a good way to get around it by kind of trying to do this definitional fiat and just saying, well, well, I say it's faith and faith isn't work. Paul says faith isn't work. So therefore, right? Because the question is, okay, but do you have the same understanding of faith of what Paul does? Or does the reformed have the same understanding of what, what of faith that Paul did? Or does someone else have, are you both wrong? Right? So this is not a good response to, to their critique. 
I think that is something that is just clearly, emphatically established by Paul. And so it, it's. Do you think? Sorry, I don't. I don't pay boy. for. Uh... I don't pay for you. It's honestly a bit confusing why this discussion even has to be had. I do not, I do not say this intending to be um, derogatory or insulting, but I feel like this is somewhat of an elementary concept. This idea of faith, faith versus works, faith is not. So the fact that he's confused is very telling, right? Because anyone who understands the reformed criticism of provisionism of of, of other views, um, even if you don't agree with it. It's very clear why they make why they make those objections that they make, right? The fact that you're confused why you even have these discussions, right? It reminds me of I, you know I was I was on this uh, the, the our, our live the other night, um, and I had to point out with, to my to my friend you know good friend C J Cox, right? Brilliant guy, but he but he made an off the off the hand comment that I that I had to correct, and that is that you know baptism. You don't understand why there's disagreements. Baptism is is it was really kind of this trivial thing, right? It's, it's really this kind of non-essential thing. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second. It, in your system, it might be trivial, but to historic Reformed theology, to Roman Catholicism, to Eastern Orthodoxy, to Lutheranism, to views that have strong sacramentology, it's not trivial at all. It actually gets to the core distinction, or distinctive of their theological system, right? It's vitally important, actually. And, and once you understand Reformed theology and its view of the covenant, covenant inclusion, why it's a mixed body, why the different, you know, the sign, the seal of the covenant, all those kinds of things, what you can't do is say that the discussion doesn't matter because it's trivial. It is not trivial at all to any view that isn't kind of really, really Zwinglian, more Zwinglian, by the way, than Zwingli would have been. Uh, and, 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 and right. So if you understand these views, what you can't say is trivial. If you understand reformed theology and you understand the historical debates, that is, if you've actually studied these things, you would understand why this has been historically a major point of contention and a major debate. Right and and uh, and Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and Arminians and Lutherans and Calvinists who debate these things, what they don't do is say, "Oh, well, that's just trivial," because they understand the importance of the concepts. They understand the importance that this plays in their different systems. So the fact that he says, "I don't even understand why we have this conversation," just is to draw a big highlighter across the screen of, and I, and I don't mean to make. This idea was condescending. I don't think I don't think this gentleman is is dumb by any means. He he seems very very bright, but he's not studied on the literature. It's a big highlighter saying I don't know what I'm talking about um, in regards to this topic, right? I I've only done YouTube research, right? That's not a good way to handle these types of discussions. And what's going to happen? And I, and I told him this. What's going to happen is that he will go the way of um, Leighton Flowers, right? A, some people don't know, especially in their own system, uh, in, in kind of provisional circles, they don't know this. For a long time, <clears throat> Reformed actually wanted to engage with with Leighton Flowers. They, they, you know, they they were they were keen to having discussions, debates. They really thought that those were going to be those were going to be for, for the last couple of years. Uh, they really just don't care what he says anymore. For the large part, they really, really don't. You'll still have them debating. They're still arguing, but they really have written him off. It, it because it's become a you know it's become a one string banjo, right? It's become a one trick pony. It's been it's been answered so many times. His straw men have been answered so many times. He he's he's just really gone into an echo chamber. The only people that take him really seriously anymore are are other provisionists and other anti Calvinists. No one outside of him. I, I mean I, I mean I'm talking to a ton of of non-Calvinists. And even they're like, yeah, we don't, we don't really, we don't really take him seriously anymore. Um, you know, no one does. That's because it's YouTube exegesis, right? It, it's, it, it's, it's getting all of your understanding of Calvinism from YouTube comments and YouTube dialogue. And, and I say this as a YouTuber, right? But what I try to do typically is to read the sources, read the academic literature, read the refereed literature in the journals, 
um, to, to not, you know, to, to not ascribe to Arminianism, historic Arminianism, what some, you know, random Arminian preacher online says, Jamie, I saw you in there. I'm going to bring you in in a minute. If you want to, if you want to come back in, if you're able to come back in. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's not a good way to handle that. And so what's going to happen is he's, he's already coming across the, 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 every video I've seen from him. I think on his video, he has or on his channel, he has uh, however many videos, 95% of them are anti-Calvinist videos. They're all kind of rehashed what we've all heard on provisionism, uh, one or on, on uh, soteriology 101, on provisionist perspective, on idol killer, right? It's nothing new. It, it's all the same. It's all the same things. He's going to go into the realm of uh, no one cares anymore. Um, so I've encouraged him. If you want to stand out, if you want to make a difference, pick up the academic literature read it, study it for two or three years before you make another video on Calvinism, pass by, you know, present some of your arguments to Calvinists and say, hey, am I presenting this right? Get some sign off and then go forward with them, right? Do some of the extra legwork um, and and you will, you will not kind of go uh, the way of the dodo, so to speak. Um, I'm not trying to say flowers of dodo. You won't go the way of extinction uh, is, is what I should say. Um, because that's, that's where this, this trend is, is, is heading. Um, Jamie said that he's on his phone for a sec. He's going to, he's going to come right back on. So, uh, but I'll keep going until he, uh, until he comes back. Not a work, uh, to have faith is not equivalent to doing righteousness. I just think that's sort of a basic level, um, you know, idea that's taken for granted in the new Testament. And so all that said, just, it is a bit confusing why this discussion even needs to be had. But I suppose at the end of the day, I can't understand why, if you have sort of these underlying assumptions about about what total depravity is and, and about, you know, God's sovereignty, where he he must be meticulously controlling everything, where he's not truly sovereign, I, I understand. Again, that is no reformed person says that. No, no one says that God has to be meticulously controlling everything. Otherwise, he isn't sovereign. Right. You may get some online Calvinists that are saying that. Uh, you may get that in Twitter. You may get that on some uh, uh, on some YouTube videos. You don't get that type of saying in any of the Reformed confessions, the the, the Reformed systematic theologies. You don't get that by reading Burkhoff, Bavinck, Burkauer. That's all the bees. You don't read that by by reading uh, Hodge. You don't read. You don't get that by reading Beaky. You don't get that by reading Horton. You don't. That that's not in the Reformed tradition. <clears throat> that may be in your kind of tulip only online hyper Calvinistic. Um, I, you know, I call it the tub tulip tulipers, the tulip only um, kind of framework less. It's weirdly enough kind of Anabaptistic Calvinists. Um, you, you just don't get that in the reform tradition. Right. So to say that this is a problem with Calvinism is just inaccurate. Um, and you can do better. Uh, you can definitely do better. Uh, Fenton really says it's embarrassing that the Christian church can't agree on anything. Well, I, I mean, I, I somewhat agree, somewhat don't agree. I think, I think there is far more agreement than a lot of people are willing to give credit for. Um, but there is a lot of disagreement. And, and one of the things that, that I started, uh, you know, feeling towards the end of my time as a Christian and then um, definitely, uh, you know, during my, my deconversion, is that there seems to be disagreement in areas that um, if something is divinely inspired, uh, if the church is being, uh, you know, led by the spirit, all that kind of stuff, it seems weird that there is disagreement on those. I, I grant that, 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 that kind of probably what's underlying the point of this comment, right? It really does seem that the, that there, we shouldn't see disagreement, not only to, the extent that we see disagreement, but also at the kind of conceptual level that we see disagreement. Like maybe we could see disagreement on eschatological, eschatological views of the end times and kind of those, those types of things, or, you know, gifts of the Holy Spirit and all that kind of stuff. What's weird is you find disagreement at the core of what the gospel, not what the gospel is. I think at the core, everyone would say what the gospel is, is that, uh, you know, uh, Jesus uh, died uh, for sinners so that whosoever should believe shall not perish but have everlasting life. I think pretty much every Christian church can agree on that. Um, there are disagreements. There are a lot of disagreements on, on, on heresy, 
and orthodoxy making co concepts though. Um, and that to me seems the problem um, that way. So uh, Jamie, how are you doing? Hey, good. Do you, that question on the screen, it seems like, uh, yeah, I mean, how, how, would you, how would you think of that as a Christian? I want to ask you a couple of different questions if you want, but um, since you're a knowledgeable theologian, but you don't believe anymore, so I know you won't be hindered by, you know, uh, pious fraud or whatever. So, <laughs> but what do you make of that? I mean, how can the Holy, how does it, you know, it seems to me if like if you're a true blue Calvinist, you wouldn't, it would be hard to accept that God regenerates people to be non-Calvinists. Like, what, how do you think about that? Uh, well, maybe, maybe rephrase your question. Maybe, maybe I'm, I, I missed oh, something. I just, when I think from like a pal, Cal, I, I really try hard to like hear where people are coming from, from different, how they read the text differently and things like yeah. that. So um, I'm just, well, I always thought from a Calvinist perspective, it, you know, seems that Calvinists usually say other Christians are Christians, right? They're regenerated or whatever. Mm -hmm. And even though they don't, they may be like far as even ones that don't believe Calvinism at all, you know, in any aspects of it. Like, how do you think about that as a Calvinist? Like, why would God regenerate someone only to not believe any of the tenets of like a Calvinistic soteriology? Or how do you think? about? Yeah. That? So, so, you know, when I was still a Calvinist, one of the things that I, that I, uh, you know, kind of uh, toyed around with is that, um, you know, I, I, I argued uh, and, and, and thought that it, it might actually be a feature, not a bug of the Bible, that there's there's lots of ambiguity in areas. Right. Because um, maybe it's the case that um, that there, there, there's such a broad ranging amount of personalities, um, cultures, all that kind of stuff that that you kind of <clears throat> even though there, there will be disagreements among people it's better to have more, you know, more people believe, right? So, so maybe it's the case that if it was so clear cut, let's say, let's just, it's, you know, for sake of argument, and I used to believe this, that Calvinism was true. I understand that compatibilism and determinism is, is sometimes conceptually hard, uh, you know, to, to, to grasp for some people. And some people actually have, uh, you know, very st strong intuition, right? I, I think, I think some people like, uh, you know, they're, they're like Tim Stratton, um, Braxton Hunter, I, I think some of these people would have major crises of faith if they came to be convinced that the Bible taught determinism, right? I, I think they would really, really have some struggles with that. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but, but, but it seems like they really have struggles. So may, maybe it's the case that the text is somewhat ambiguous, although I don't think it's that ambiguous, but maybe it's somewhat ambiguous because that's God's way of, 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 uh, you know, t taking away some of the boundaries, um, so that more people would believe. Right. So, so maybe, yeah, maybe it's the fun. case that, yeah. that, um, that, you know, the sign gifts, right. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's not clear whether cessationism, uh, and, and, and it, I, because I think it's not clear. I, I don't think it's clear if cessationism or continuationism is, is, is the right view. I struggled, I, not struggled in the sense of like had emotional angst, but I was really on the fence of what was actually biblically accurate when I was a Christian. Um, and maybe that's the case because, you know, some, some people are okay with the, the ambiguity. Um, some people, you know, are, are going to be, uh, you know, they're going to believe if they, if they have kind of more like sign gift experiences and they find that there, some people are going to maybe be a little bit more anti-supernatural, just that's their bent. And if they can find cessation as them, they're going to be much more comfortable believing. So maybe that, that ambiguity kind of allows for a, broader breadth of people coming to believe in, in what's contained more at a core in the Bible. How did you deal with, or would you say some of the texts that seem to indicate cessationism is not true? You could take that some of those is like uh, not contextually meaning like uh, not for the ongoing future forever, but just in that general vicinity of the apostolic time or what? Like, how do you, I'm not even Sorry. sure. I can't remember how cessationists argue against the, the texts that seem to indicate that there would be continuation of those spiritual gifts. Yeah. I I mean, just... If you're, if you're a really hard cessationist, right. So, so there are different types of cessationists, right. I, I, I was kind of like a, like a, like a moderate cessationist, right. Which is, which is basically that the sign gifts, Right, a hard cessationist is going to say the sign the sign gifts stopped at the closing of the canon, 
right? They're just going to say, once the canon was complete, no more sign gifts. Other, others like what, what I was, which was, was basically, well, I, I'm pretty skeptical or I was pretty skeptical that sign gifts um, were normative for the church, right? Where I didn't think they were the normative Christian experience. Um, and, and I, and I think historically you could justify that, you know, throughout, throughout the, the church tradition that, you know, speaking in tongues and all that kind of stuff was not the normal Christian experience. Um, but I agree with that. Pretty but much. maybe I thought maybe in certain circumstances, <clears throat> for example, the gospel going to somewhere new to some new people group, kind of maybe, maybe if there was like this outbreaking of the gospel or there was, you know, this kind of special dispensation, not, I wasn't a dispensation, but the special, the special time of the spirit, um, where geographically there was some type of, you know, movement that had to happen. Um, and so maybe that's why, you know, I, I thought, you know, uh, you know, Western civilization is getting worse and worse and worse. Maybe that's why we see this kind of rise of charismatic movement because the Holy Spirit is having to kind of reestablish the gospel in some areas. The problem is, is that I found also gener generally the more charismatic it got, the less gospel based it got. <laughs> right. um, that's, so that's and I like that. What? Go ahead. Say that again. I was going to say that I never even considered that. Like, that's funny. Like that maybe some of the, some of the outbreaks of speaking in tongues was a necessary thing. I mean, I, you hear those missionary stories, right? You know? Yeah. Was, you know, where that, it's like, I, I kind of, I kind of believe that guy, you know, he seems like a dedicated his life to it. Why would he lie about it? Like, doesn't seem right. But. Who would die for a lie? Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> lots of people. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I think um, uh, that that's generally how when when I was still you know uh, when I was still a Christian that, that I I understood kind of um, denominational and theological differences even under you know a paradigm of, of Calvinism because under Calvinism you have you know this is this is one of the areas where I think a lot of critics of Calvinism stumble um, is that they 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 don't understand the you know Calvinistic understanding of ends and means and that that they collapse down. You know, this was one of my biggest critiques of, of flowers and others. They would just, they would collapse down the decree and providence into one thing. Um, and so if God decreed something, why would it have to go? We, why would you have to preach the gospel? And why would you have to do it? Cause they just completely ignore that. There still has to be this kind of providential outworking of means to accomplish the thing that was decreed. Um, and so, you know, the, the, those types of objections just, they, they always fall flat for me because I just said, well, I mean, the instant you distinguish between conceptually between decree and providence, there's just no more problem there. Yeah, I hear you. Well, so for one of the things that for me it strikes and it's kind of just a simple thing is like if I'm, I want to get what I want to feel what the original writer was trying to like, if I can deduce or get from the text, what I think makes the most sense from the writer without being biased, which is difficult, but like one of the things that strikes me is like when I hear Calvinists arguing sometimes for, but you can still have, it's still true that God determined it or whatever. It's like, you can always put that over the text, but so what would you say to when I read the parable of the sower and Jesus says an enemy has done this, you know, and then later he gives the interpretation like Satan, it's Satan that sowed the bad seed. You know what I mean? Like, does he want me to think, well, yeah, Satan did it in the story, the narrative that God's telling, but ultimately God did it. And, but then I think, well, yeah, God knew he allowed it. I want to think like, I kind of use the term allowance or, but I, my kind of theodicy is that God is responding to the rebellion started by Satan. And like, it's, once you get all the way back to that and you say, you know, if the, if, you know, the devil had turned to God after Eve blames the snake and he says, Hey, yeah, but I just did it because you determined me to, to do it or something. And it's just like, what would God have said to him? Like, shut up. Or would he say, yeah, you're right. I did want you to do that. It's like, it see, it feels wrong to me. Like, what would you say to that? Those things? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I would push back and just say, well, <clears throat> I, lots of things actually. Um, but primarily the, the, the thing that I would say is that once you once you're able to distinguish, you know, Calvinists call it the two wills, right? Once you're able to distinguish between two different levels of willing, right? It's, maybe maybe it's inaccurate, not inaccurate, but maybe it's not helpful the way that Calvinists talk about two wills because for for people who aren't in that who aren't in that tradition or don't understand what that is, 
they think of it as like two different faculties as if the Calvinist is saying God actually has two different faculties of will, right? When really what they mean is, is, is actually kind of mundane. It's that, you know, God wills something on one level, but he wills it on a different level as well. We, we do the exact same thing all the time. Right? Well, yeah. Cause even the non-Calvinist is going to say, well, God has a will that we don't sin, but God has a will to allow sin. And so even if you're a Calvinist or not, you have to kind of accept that God, you know, you use the word like permits or allows, like there's a, you have to say, if you're not a Calvinist, God's ultimate will is to allow us to sin, but he, then he has another will that says he doesn't want us to sin. But yeah. The, well, see, and this, this is where, like that. yeah, th th like that, but this is also where I, where I push back just on any, you know, I, I think there's a problem for, for, this is a problem for theists generally also how you get around, you know, problems of evil. But I think this is a problem for anyone who also ostensibly wants to hold to the biblical narrative, right? Because think think about think about creation, right? God God created this world, right, and not some other world, right? God God could have created a world where Satan didn't God, God didn't have to create Satan, right? Um, well, he didn't create Satan, right? He created if you want to distinguish between Satan and Lucifer as conceptually, obviously I'm not saying the names were actual or something, but the devil, right. When we're talking about that, that whatever that being is, the being right? which became the devil, I would want to make that distinction, but yes, he did know that he would become the devil. So yeah, the, the, the devil, right. He, he was, he, you know, in, in, in the court, he was the Satan, he was the accuser. Right. So, well, and, and, and part of this go by the, uh, pardon, pardon the hobby horse for a second. Uh, I think I think Christian Satanology and angelology and demonology is wildly overdeveloped. Um, I, I, I think that we have a the the the, the Christian Church um, and then uh, therefore us in, in Western civilization um, think we think think we know things about what the Bible teaches about the devil that are uh, just not in. You think the the Ezekiel twenty eight and Isaiah fourteen or sixteen or whatever have been overly way overly attributed to to the devil? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so there, there, so, so I should say that, but, but going back, so <clears throat> God didn't have to create Lucifer, right? But he actual, he, he, he created a world, he actualized a world where he created Lucifer and he could have created a different world. Maybe he could, could have created a world with Lucifer where Lucifer didn't fall. Right, but he chose the one where Lucifer fell, and maybe he, you know, he he didn't have to create a tree, right? So, so there, there's all there's all these things where where if God wanted to create a world where the fall never happened, he could have created a world where the fall never happened, right? The fact that the fall happened is because God decided that that's what would happen in the world that He created. Wait, 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 right there. So, yeah. I think well, the way most people argue that you can. You could say that, but maybe I, I'm, I've been thinking lately that to say he could have created a different, I think he could have created a world where he could have stopped it from happening, let's say. Um, but then he would have been in, intervening in a way that he decided he wasn't going to intervene. In other words, I don't buy the Molinistic thing where God chooses between free will, you know, worlds with free will creatures that then chooses, determines which one of those he wants. I don't think that works. I think that's a contradiction. So I don't accept, I, I think God created the one world it, and someone's going to say I'm an open theist now or something, but I, I, I think that's a problem. So I, I don't accept that Molinistic notion or whatever, where. Well, God, I'm not a Molinist. So, so, you know, this just, this comes down from, you know, just, just, well, well, let me ask you this. I mean, do you think that God, <clears throat> do you think God could have created a world different than this one? Yeah. Right. So I don't so, think, I, I think he could have. I don't think you have to go to Molinism. I think you can say God could have, God could have created. Well, let me ask you one more question. Do you think God created this world? Do you think God is omniscient or are you an open theist? Like, do you think God no, think he's created this world knew every single true fact about this world that would ever happen? I do. I think he knew every, I think yeah. he knew ahead of time. Yeah. So he still, so what, what did, so what, whatever you think of, of, of counterfactuals and all, and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, so God, God could have created this world or some other world, right? But he knew that if he created this, knowing that he's creating this world, he knew there's this true, that when we talk about this world, it's just, a, it's it's a set of true propositions, right? Right. 
And he's saying that's the set that's going to be true, right? He's 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 saying all the truth value of those is going to be true right. in the right. actual world. They're not going to be the alternative sequence. They're not going to be counterfactual. Those are going to be true in the actual world. He's determining what will be true, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, otherwise it, it would just, it would have been a different world. Right. Right. So, so, so I, I, I think so one of the, one of the arguments that I make is that, well, part of the problem with, with determined is that it's, it's overdefined, right? Or well, let me, let me say it this way. Part of the critique thinks that in order to defend determinism, you have to overdefine it, right? Whereas I can, you know what, even when I was, you know, a, a Christian and a Calvinist, and I still do this as a theist, I can say, look, by determinism, I simply mean this very minimal fact that God was the one that decided which light switch to flip on which set of propositions is going to be true in the actual world. And once God decided that that's what's going to be true in the actual world, law of identity, the actual world couldn't, it's not possible for the actual world to not be not the actual world. I hear what you're saying. I right think the for, thing that most people have a problem with, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. Just, that, just that I think it has to do with, with um, you know, responsibility in the sense of, causing evil that's what people are really having a problem with but the question is is it true that when god determines that world in what ways is it is the uh culpability on god or not it seems like there's it just feels wrong like with justice right it, we take into account when there's mitigating circumstances or somebody was pressuring someone and then but you're gonna say well he's not pressuring them well uh, i don't know maybe that is a difference uh, yeah. See, 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 I've always said, I, I, I don't, so I, I'm, a, I'm a compatibilist. I'm a determinist. I'm a deterministic compatibilist, I should say. Um, although somewhat of a soft variety. Right. So, so I can, I, I think that I can confidently say that in some sense, God has determined what my choices will be. Not even as a Christian, just as a theist, because I think God is on mission, right? I think it's just entailed by omniscience. but God, God has, God has determined what I'll choose right? I don't think that it means, unless you mean either in the deficient sense or in some type of vague ultimate sense, because you can, you can cause, can I, there's like a dozen different ways cause is used in language, just like there's a bunch of different ways that the able to is used differently. That's where the problem is. I think. Yeah. So I don't think, I, I don't think that God forces, coerces, even causes, except in that very ultimate sense of uh, the fact that he determined what would be true in the actual sense. I don't think it's the case that God, like I'm some type of puppet that God is making choose things, right? right. God has determined it through my normal agency. Yeah. Like um, me and CJ were talking about this last night and I was just like, well, he was pointing out that, well, he determined that by evil hands that they crucified Jesus. It's like he, he determined, it says he determined that they're, you know, with evil hands that it would happen or whatever. And it's like, well, is it saying that because it wants to suggest, you know, or because it's suggesting that they can be guilty while God still determined it then to have, you know, it's like, where does the, where do you trace that back to where God makes it? So it couldn't be any other, any other uh, possibility or whatever. It's it is the text one. You could read it either way. But I, to me, the causal sure thing. I want to ask about the causal thing. Yeah. Well, let me let me go back to the the to the to the axe thing because I'm not sure you can read it. I, I've argued this. I argued this in my opening statement with Dan Chapa. I've argued this in 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 numerous debates. When it comes to Acts, Acts two and Acts four, I don't I don't think you can get anything except for determinism out of it, right? Because Acts Acts two. Um, Right. It says, you know, in speaking of Jesus, it says this man delivered over by the predetermined plan uh, and the foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by hands of godless men. Right. So the men. Hmm. Sh sure. So godless men and put it and, and put him to death. Right. So so that Did whole God situation something godless. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Well, so so it's God's plan. It, it's not, it's not just by his foreknowledge. He knew that godless men would crucify Jesus. 
right? It's by his his uh, predetermined plan, right? His his uh, his pra or his abule or uh, paris bule. I can't remember the exact Greek, right? It's by it's by his predetermined plan and foreknowledge, right? A lot of the times, the 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 incompatibilist, the libertarian, wants to basically make it just by God just knew that they would do this. But it doesn't just say that it's, it, it's it's by his predetermined plan. The plan is actually the, the, the causal mechanism that brings it about. You couple that with Acts 4. Right? You couple that with Acts 4, where it says, um, you know, for truly in this city we're gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, or this in his prayer to God, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined, pra-aridzo to occur, right? It's it's not by your foreknowledge, right? right? It's that, and it's not that you knew what they would do. It's that what they did, they did by your hand and your purpose, what those predestined, pra-aridzo, foreordained to occur. The reason why, not only is that just clearly determined language, what I find very interesting is it says they did it they did whatever his hand foreordained would happen. There's never a case in the Bible where God's hand doing something by the hand of God. There's not a ton of references, but whenever that happens, it is causal. God takes direct causal credit. It's by your hand that this has Israelite coming out of Egypt. It was by God's mighty hand that they did it. Right. So it's by his hand. And then when you, when in that context, sorry, I'm almost done and then I'll, I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop <laughs> preaching a little bit. But it, what's interesting is if you read in the exact same context, exact same prayer, right? Following through. And now Lord, look at your threats and grant it to your bond servants to speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders to take place through your name, the Holy Servant Jesus. In the exact... Do, 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 does the incompatibilist, does the libertarian think that the healing miracles are not directly caused by the working of God? Does God get causal credit for it by his hand? Or do they say, oh, well, he just foreknew that those people would be healed and he allowed it? Right. No, God's definitely taking full credit for it. But um, it's the exact same for It's the exact okay, same. Okay, what about when it says later in the same prayer? No, absolutely. I think so. Well, like it also promises that in the new covenant that he would, you know, what would you say the difference is when, because he uses that same phraseology when he says, you know, I'm going to make a new covenant, but I'm not going to do it like I did with them when I took them by the hand out of Egypt, but I'm going to put my law in their hearts and they'll be my people. Like, is he contrasting the new covenant as not being the same actuated way by his hand? I mean, to me, the the application of that is just more to do with taking like direct credit in a particular sort of way. I, which, I don't know which, that, is, which is fine. I mean, I, I don't think I have to go to Jeremiah to, to talk about the, 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 the covenant because he says, I took them by, the, by their hand. It's not, the same, it's not the same phrase. What's happening in Acts 4 is it's saying that the crucifixion of Jesus happened by what God's hand praorizod, predestined, foreordained to take place. No, God's sure. hand brought it about. No right? and there, and there's, there's no biblical example. Uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've challenged everyone to go find one. Find a single biblical example where God's hand is, is attributed to an outcome. Or sorry, an outcome is attributed to God's hand. Find one where it's, it's, it's bald permission. You won't right. find it. It is always causal. God's, if it's by God's hand, God is the one that is directly causing it to happen yeah well do you think he was it wants to say like i don't know i I'm, i don't know i can't really uh but that but that's my point is that, that that when you get to acts four when it says that they 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 were gathered to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur you just whatever okay, but whether or not you're that, you can't exegetically say that that just means oh well he foreknew it so his hand um, his, he just allowed, you know, it, it was just kind of this permission to allow them to do what they wanted. 
Like that would be no, like right, saying no, no, I, well, God, I, didn't, I, God didn't by his hand rescue Israel from Egypt. He just he just allowed them to leave Egypt. Well, the, the, but I mean, then you have to ask the question though. Then I guess that's a distinguishing exception because he does that mean he does everything that strongly? I mean, does that mean he's giving permission about everything else? Because it seems to me that that wants to emphasize that the particular intervention of God in a very strong right. way. Which, which is totally fine, right? So, so I, so I don't have to make the argument that God, God by His hand is causing every single thing directly, right? That, that doesn't have to be the argument, right? I, I've argued this before um, in, 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 in various different episodes. I, I, I did one um, called the fragility of, in, of incompatibilism. I've also done one called the warranted case for biblical compatibilism, right? It, especially within the sphere of, of Christianity. The only thing the, 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 the Christian compatibilist needs to show to prove that compatibilism is true and incompatibilism and therefore libertarianism is false, right? They just need to show one example, a single example, where something is both determined and the agents are held responsible for their action, right? That's all they have to prove because... For libertarianism to be true, libertarian is an incompatible position. It says that in principle, something cannot be determined and free in a way that is necessary for some, the, the, the person to be responsible. So for so so that if something is, is determined, the agent is not responsible. Just in principle, those two things can't both be true. Right? Okay, well, I'm definitely not that. I wouldn't, because I think that is true. I think that sort of compatibilistic thing happens all the time. I think that's why God's intervening and changing the course of history. Um, but the thing is, is that I look at that as a sort of judgment. Like now I would say if God had to like groom them from birth to, to be evil for that purpose um, all along the way, uh, like a puppet or whatever, then they wouldn't be culpable. But if he takes somebody at some point where, so, so I think there's kind of like rules of engagement. That's just a theory that God, he's given man dominion on some level and then he's, but he would does intervene as a, you know, righteously, even though I think a lot of people would say like, you know, they don't recognize that God actually brings up Job to Satan. And I'm like, yeah, God brought up, he wanted to test or prove Job by bringing it up to Satan. So God instigated that. That's true. God made sure Which, that why, the- why, I have so many moral problems with the book of Job uh, but that, that, that we have a different conversation about, but. Well, right. I just find that people that aren't Calvinists don't want to accept that. I don't necessarily accept that because I'm a Calvinist, but I think it's worth pointing out. And people try to go all all over the place trying to de, you know deny that or something. But so I already think God interacts in such a way that causes or determines people to do certain things. But I think I tend to think of more of like it's it's like because they've hardened their hearts, He's going to use that. You know, and in, even in some cases, he's going to do it in such a way like when he hardens Pharaoh's heart, like God hardened, God determined his heart to be hard. But I, I mean, I think I could have hardened it, Pharaoh's heart by sending a messenger sure. in such a way, you know. Sure, so, but, the, but, the, but the point here is that um, it, like, do, do you think that when do, do you think that Pilate and Herod were also guilty and culpable for crucifying Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the the point is, is that is that their their actions can be entirely determined, and they determined actually in such a, a a hard deterministic straight line way, where God is actually immediately causing them by His hand to crucify. Yeah. So that it's, they couldn't have done otherwise. They wouldn't yeah, have done. So I'm, I'm, I'm making an argument from from the greater to the lesser, right? So, so if if that very hard kind. And, and I don't mean hard determinism in the type of determinist incompatibilism, but I mean that very like that very that very direct immediate causation of God by His hand to cause them to crucify Jesus, and yet they're so responsible. If that can be true, then I, I don't need to say that that God is intervening that directly in all human decisions. But I, I feel like then I can I, I can easily help myself and say, well, well, I mean everything is still determined, and people are responsible for their actions. Okay. Well, I, okay. So let me put it, let me say it this way. Now, if, if, um, if they had been, if the circumstances were that they would not have wanted to crucify Jesus because for, for the right reasons, uh, but then God intervenes to make them do it against what they would have done otherwise. 
then there might be a problem. I suspect that, like, let's say you could say something like hypothetically, they would have probably crucified Jesus, but God intervenes in such a way that to ensure that it, they do it like in, in some sort of, uh, you know, this is speculative, but just, I would presume that he didn't groom them for that from birth. In other words, he took, he takes, he can take evil people and then he'll use their purposes and, and, you know, ensure that they do a certain evil thing for a judgment. And that's, I don't think that's uh, a problem unless, you know, he takes someone who's let's say righteous or whatever, and then forces them to do something evil and then punishes them for it. That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, so, so, uh, so I, I generally agree, right? So this, this is generally where compatibilists are going to distinguish between categorical ability and conditional ability. Um, and they're, you know, they're going to talk about those types of things and they're going to say, well, you know, generally what they're talking about is not, uh, it's not force, right? It's so, so it's not necessarily that God is forcing them to work against what they would otherwise want to do. That generally we have an intuition um, is a violation of freedom. Now, I would actually say the, the, that there are glimpses in the Bible that 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 at least, and, and maybe this will be reason, you know, maybe this is a reason to, to reject the Bible. It seems to me actually that there are some cases where the where um, God um, does force someone to to sin or hold a false belief in some way that they wouldn't otherwise have done if God didn't intervene um, and and force it upon them and still holds them responsible for it. So you know, I, oh, I, I which one? What's that? Which story? So which it, 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 I actually think it's didactic. It's not even a story. So I, I think Second Thessalonians two. Um, oh yes. The so it has the statement, right? So, so it says, um, and with all the deception and wickedness, right? He's talking about the law that's coming, all the deception and wickedness of those who perish because they did not accept and love the truth so as to be saved. Now, th there's there's an interpretive issue that happens here, right? And I think exegetically, what I'm going to say is more accurate, and I'll explain why. But it says, going into verse 11, for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. Why? You're going to say the reason is God's doing, right? Right. So why? In order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Now, the typical way to read this normally by, by like non-Calvinists, even some Calvinists and others, is that because they already didn't love the truth, it's like a judicial hardening thing, because they already didn't love the truth, God then sent a deluding spirit right. to like confirm them in their delusion, but mm -hmm. he, but he's judging them because they just generally didn't love the truth in the first place. That's I a, yeah. yeah. I have a problem with that reading for several reasons. The first one is if they're already guilty of not loving the truth, notice that at the very end of verse 12, it's the, the reason why he sends the deluding spirit is so that they'll believe what's false. Sorry, the verse 11. It, I agree with that. But the lead in is already, the, they already, the, it already says because they didn't accept the truth. Okay. Okay. I hear you. Right. So, so they didn't accept the truth. And so he sends a deluding spirit so that they don't accept the truth that they already don't accept. Right. Which seems weird. Then further, why, do, why does he want them to not accept the truth? In order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness, right? So in order, so he, so he sends the spirit so that they'll believe what's false so that he can judge them. Wow, but okay. if they already don't believe the truth and this whole thing is an act of judgment anyways, not only would he be making them not believe what they already didn't believe, but he'd be judging them for the thing that he's already judging them for. Do you think this parallels what's going on with, uh, bringing the cross about, I, I think there's maybe a parallel here with what. No, whatever. so I, I think what's happening is that um, in verse 11, the the hinge clause, the the, the henna clause, the 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 for this reason. I think that what it's doing is saying um, that that these people, the, these people, for for God will send upon them. Uh, sorry, um, the deception of wickedness for uh, for those who perish because they did not accept the truth uh, of the love as to be saved. It, I think we read the next clause. I think it's more accurate. And this is exegetically entirely viable. This is not like some some weird, you know, you could, to say, right. 
and for this purpose or and to this end or this is why God sent them the deluding spirit. Right. He's I, I think the second half of that is explaining. It's now it's yeah. now saying, look, they don't love the truth. And 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 so that they're not saved. Why, why don't they love the truth? It's for that reason. That's why God sent them to the Holy Spirit. What about the past tense? Uh, the past tense of the leading. It's a, lead up it's a future it. past tense. I, I, you, you can use Eris a past tense. So so when when you read through um, like a lot of um, like Book of Revelation or all of a discourse, it'll use past tense or past perfect tense sure. because it's saying um, like at that time they Looking will have had this. Right. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't back in the future. The right. Right. No. Sure. Yeah. So I'll have, to, I'll have to think about that one. But my theodicy is there's a sense where uh, a lot that verse has a lot to do with my theodicy because I think that's my whole idea of, of would be that God's essentially proving His people, and this is why I think sometimes the whole Calvinist Arminian thing is just like almost a distraction from what I think is what's really going on. Um, I hear where you're coming from. I'll have to look at that. And then I'm, I'd be curious. I'll have to look at it more closely, but I have to go for a minute here, but can I ask you one more question? Do you? Sure. Yeah. I was going to ask you what your theodicy is, but yeah, if you want to ask. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's essentially John C. Peckham's theodicy of love. I, I, I like that idea. It's. um. Oh, we should talk about that at some point. Cause I think it's one of the, I, I think it's one of the, the actually the, the, the worst theodicy. So, so yeah, we, yeah. We, we should, we should come back and have that. Come. Maybe not the worst. I think the free will theodicy may be the worst, but um we, we definitely could, should come back I, I think this kind of theodicy can i mean you have to like you have to basic like i said you have to i have an issue with god determining satan to fall or whatever i i think the, i don't think the text wants us to think that but i, I we can get it at another time or whatever but yeah uh, i know some of your arguments on that i i would just say because of that god's essentially proving what was the other question i was going to ask you never mind uh the you know what i can't remember I'll think of it in like a second, but uh, we were talking about maybe I don't know. Maybe we were talking about Second Thessalonians two, deluding influence. Yeah, actually, you know what? I'll let me think it through. Anyways, so I'll, I'll just uh, I was going to ask you one other thing, but I can't remember what it was. So maybe next time. Thanks for having me, though. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'd love to hear some of your objections to that theodicy. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'm going to look at Second Thessalonians, and is there any uh, anything I could look at in particular on that? that you uh, I mean, I, I would I would just look at there's uh, there's a couple extradotical commentaries. There's one uh, in the I think it's the Nicot series um, that that's that's pretty helpful. Um, and I, I can send you on the I, I have a couple of documents that I can send. Uh, yeah, send me the one that kind of uh, where it helped me follow your. Uh, I think I kind of, I get where you're coming from, but uh, yeah, just send it to me or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, general, generally, I just think that there's two ways to translate that that connective clause, um, and one way causes uh, verse 11 and 12 to just be massively redundant and pointless, um, mm -hmm. and there's one way that leads it to be a causal explanation for the for the prior clause, which makes make more sense. There's no redundancies, um, and it's exegetically feasible within the within the grammar. So. Um, I, yeah, I try to recognize that about text and I try to get people to be more to realize that because people will be like, oh, this is they think that's like there's only one way you could read it. And it's, I think it's always good to be see, you know, those sorts of things. I, I, it seems to me that I can see that it could be read that way. So, um, yeah, I'm going to look at it more closely. It kind of is what's I'll ask you this. What's that's just how grammar works. Right. But would you say that there's literary patterns like do you do you ever look at like chiastic structures and parallelisms and mm -hmm. stylistic things yeah. like yeah i think i think literary structures are 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 very helpful chiastic structures are chiastic structures are often helping it's helpful in figuring out like what um what point the author is trying to emphasize when you um, compare both ends or whatever right yeah so it, 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 you know whether, whether, whether it's the bookends or whether it's the center where it culminates in, a, in, in, a, in an important mm -hmm. point Right, those are helpful. I think literary, especially when we start talking about um, uh, mimesis and um, you know polemics against uh, other other writings. When you when you start looking at literary structures and um, and and conceptual le lexical framework uh, or lexical uh, parallels to other uh, texts, that that becomes interesting to tell kind of what's happening and what what the author is actually trying to do with those texts. Um, I do I, I talk about that yeah. a lot in Genesis one. Um, but there's there's a lot of that that happens, I, I think, in the Gospels as well. So, 
Yeah. Yeah. I made I made a chiastic uh, thing with on Colossians two, sixteen or what is it six through nineteen, because there's a lot of a lot of different interpretations of that text, and I think that I'm I'm still kind of working out because sometimes the, the the connecting sides or whatever that parallel each other because those can be like antithetical or they can be or what do you call it um, the same you know saying the same thing but sometimes they can be I don't know if the words antithetical parallelism or whatever whatever it's called but and sometimes you have to figure that out or whatever, but uh, yeah, cool. All right, man. Yeah. Peace out. All right. Thanks for joining. All right. Well, I'm actually at, at about two hours and 20 minutes now. Um, I think I actually said most of what I was going to say about the, uh, the video on YouTube. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap it up here. Uh, thank you so much for joining. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, commendations, or condemnations, please uh, feel free to reach out, me, reach out to me at uh, the free thinker podcast at gmail.com. Visit the blog at freethinkerpodcast.blogspot.com or come and buy the Freed Thinker group page on Facebook and join the discussion there. As always, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Have a 